I wanted to welcome everybody to the 2015 Lacoque Lectures. Um, this is the third lecture of this year's series. And uh, I want to welcome you all to the Orthopedic Institute here on the Hill. Um, so uh, I wanted to tell a little bit about Lacoque, since uh, it's named after him. Um, Lacoque is actually the orthopedist here in Seattle. Uh, he was a, uh, a uh, got his MD degree and uh, actually became a clinical instructor of anatomy at, uh, in Seattle and worked a lot at the Children's Hospital. Um, he's a uh, big name in uh, orthopedics locally. He started uh, one of the first orthopedic clinics here on the hill, which was uh, Seattle Orthopedic and Fracture Clinic. And uh, after that, uh, Seattle Orthopedic and Fracture Clinic uh, joined with one of the other orthopedic groups and is now the sort of big orthopedic group here on the hill. Um, he was a uh, big interest in children and <coughs> orthopedics and teaching, and uh, this lecture is named after him. And so it's in that spirit that we uh, always like to bring in people who are sort of renowned in their field. Um, we've had people from all over, you know, joint surgeons, shoulder. Uh, last year we had Gantz come in, gave a lecture, and uh, this year's no exception. So. Um, our uh, lecturer is uh, Dr. Andrew Burgess. Um, anyone who does any kind of trauma, especially at Harborview where we're doing lots of pelvic trauma, you're gonna recognize the name. Uh, Dr. Uh, Burgess uh, got his uh, training at, uh, in New York, uh, Albany, Med Albany Medical College, um, did his uh, undergrad, did his um, MD, did his residency, um, did a fellowship at uh, Maryland Shock Trauma, uh, which uh, if anyone has uh, visited, it's a great trauma institution. If you're coming from Harbor, you'll recognize it. Uh, and, uh, and now is uh, actually, uh, I actually found it interesting when you look at a CV, most people are professors at, you know, maybe one university, maybe two. I started looking at his uh, positions. He's at the, I was at the Johns Hopkins. He's at the University of Texas, but he's also at the uh, University of South Florida. Is that correct? University of South Florida, and yes. Yeah, yes. so it's, uh, he's spread all over the place in case for the West Coast, Florida's on the South. And, Maryland's <laughs> So, uh, as, a, as a trauma surgeon, he's done an enormous <coughs> number of chapters and lectures on uh, trauma. Um, he published his article in 1987, Young and Burgess. Uh, and again, all of us who've taken the boards, you know, at some point or another, you have to remember that and learn all the classifications, but uh, he's sort of one of the uh, fathers of trauma surgery. Um, yesterday, we had a great lecture um, not only about orthopedics, but last night's lecture, um, and I think there'll be a link if you missed it, you can get it online. Um, but a great lecture, which was sort of the uh, crossroads between uh, orthopedic trauma, the automobile industry, computer design, and difficulties of uh, dealing with uh, individual humans in terms of trying to prevent injuries. And it was an amazing set of lectures on, uh, on just how the automobiles and preventing injuries and all the stuff that we see uh, over at the over at Harborview. Uh, so I want to introduce uh, Dr. Burgess, who's uh, going to be giving us a lecture on pelvic fractures, the East Coast view. Yeah. Uh, thanks. What? Uh, thank you. Thanks. I appreciate that. It's good. This really feels like home, and uh, a lot of you know what I mean, especially the gray hairs. And I've said it before, so for those who are hearing the repeat, it does. And uh, it's great to see some folks that have been with this issue of trauma since, I wouldn't call it the beginning, but it sort of was when we broke off into a separate specialty that really took care of it. And a lot of that was birthed on the West Coast, and a lot of that West Coast product was Seattle-based. Uh, I apologize to the other guys ye yesterday that have been veterans of this, and um, uh, Keith's showing up this morning. So some of this is going to be, um, if you think I put you to sleep for years past, this is the ultimate snoozer, but wh what it is is a bit of the history of it. So a lot of these slides I kind of dug out of the path, but it was how we came to, to our way of looking at things, and a lot of it was mechanism-based, and it was a way to look at stuff. I, I, and I, I don't know if you remember me saying yesterday, <clears throat> just like damage control orthopedics, well, a, guy in my, a guy in my shop uh, published that article years ago, and you stand on a podium, and they ask you, uh, what do you think of Dr. Scalia's article on damage control orthopedics? And that's something we've been doing for 12 years, and he assigned the name to it, and he was the one that wrote it all the way to the bank. So I hate him. 
Uh, not really. On the other hand, I also told you a story yesterday, for those of you who knew, that standing on a podium with Marv Tile, and who we got our entire pelvic classification from Marv, and then the politics of it came, and the AO wanted him to sort of go to ABC, and he took that. And all we did, we liked lateral compression, AP compression, and vertical shear. It was, came out of George Pennell and Marv Tile's work and, and, and had a lot of Toronto flavor to it. And we thought we were just building on it, type 1, type 2. We think we can subset it and have some fun with it. And then years later, he gets known to the ABCs because that's the one that takes root. And we're, we're still in this Young and Burgess thing, which is totally Pennell and Tile's classification. I'm standing on a podium, and he gets asked, Dr. Child, do you think your classification has more substance or Dr. Burgess's? So I've been on both sides of that equation where I've freely stolen from other people and, and, they, and they have, and, and you don't look at it as theft, it just happens, but it's kind of fun. And that's, that's where we started. And we showed you that yesterday. I'm still a consultant to striker. I think uh, mine came as an anatomist, a little bit of a history of anatomist, and that's where East Coast, if you take Baltimore's um, look at the pelvis sort of came from the, the anatomy point of view. And we were in our early phases of car crash reconstruction and we had um, lots of pelvic fractures and they resided, anybody that was an inpatient resided on the old rotating boom. So every day you went through every fracture of anybody that's still in the house. Even though you're, uh, you're, ta you're taking care of them might, might be just as a late consultant as they go to rehab, they're still coming up every day. And then started to trickle in first the photographs and then our early crash reconstructions of, of the impact at the time. Those of the were vehicle based or pedestrian based or even industrial crush. And so we, we would have the, the x-ray shown to us. We started to have, they weren't digital films in the early days, but Polaroids and other things of the car being disassembled by our crash team. And look up, it was obvious where the hit was and the direction the hit came. And, and a, a sort of common sense pattern started to to evolve about. And then we also knew, as these were coming up, we'd be look, we had the car crash film, the x-ray, and somebody would bring the chart in, and we knew there were associated, associated visceral hits, uh, pulmonary contusion, solid viscous, uh, need for a chest tube, C-spine, and that's where this came from. I think uh, the direction, severity, and predictable patterns of associated injury are, uh, and it came, comes to be fun. If you ever get into this type of thing, you see the film, and that then what you want to happen is you guess on the x-rays, uh, you guess on the associated injuries, and you do it publicly. So that if you're wrong, your colleagues will give it to you. And if you're right, you can kind of strut your stuff. And that, that gets you better at it. It kind of moves you into the, you learn. This is what I think added a lot of value to us. Old, old pictures, but this is an artist that I work with uh, who was an OR tech during the day, and some dissections are, that we resurrected from the museums almost at uh, University of Maryland and, and some we re-dissected. And I think herein lies where the knowledge base is. If something renders that ring on the right unstable, either by tearing it as asunder, <laughs> ripping it open, or compressing it toward the midline, one can begin to get a feel for what happens to the organs it protects. Neurovascular substances, the lower GI tract, um, venous plexus in front, arterial tree, whatever it is. And you, once you realize how strong these ligaments are, you, you have to assume whether it, the, the injury is reflected in the bone or in the way the bones are disassociated, that that same amount of tensile strength or shear or whatever was assigned to the soft tissue. And you get a feeling for what associated injuries you might find. You then commit to it. And in our early days, and I'll refer to this a lot, sorry to repeat, but our <clears throat> first two ORs in this abandoned hospital that was shock trauma in the early days, 12 beds, two ORs eventually going to three. Air conditioning in the room, the standard unit was sort of in the room. It, it smelled like a pseudomonas factory. And, but across the hall were the admitting area beds for, the, for what was the ER and the helicopter would land. And um, the elevator on top of the heliport wouldn't take a stretcher. So we drove a white van to the top, picked up the patient, came swirling down in this, and you're pumping on the chest and you're banging on the sides of the van. The only opening we got into the back of the hospital was through the exit door, which was an air management door with the plastic sheets. Bio biological waste had been pushed out 30 seconds before. So our patients were pre-basted as they came in. We couldn't figure out why we had an infection rate by the time. So this was, but the thing that what made it cool, 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 pardon the language, for us was, can you, can you unscrub and come over here? This, this patient has now been 10 minutes and tell us what you think. So we became, 
at the senior level, this is the only place that ever happened to me because we never could totally reconstruct that environment, was we'd walk out and we'd put our hands in these patients during the middle of the resuscitation. And our opinion got valued and what we could do got valued. And our thoughts, because we became the most experienced people in this, our thoughts began to get appreciated. Maybe I'm lying. This is the old stuff, but I, I just like this because it makes the point. So I'll, I'll repeat myself from yesterday for those of you that may be new in the room. There's two patients lying side by side in the ER. They're both hypotensive. And they, they're both, um, ah, button on mic. So they're both um, hypotensive and sick. You're going to get your hands on both of them and issue an opinion and be somewhat of the next few minutes of care. Um, get a little history of the first one on the top there, and he or she was T-boned, and there's a little bit long extrication time. And so your hands, you, those of you that experience take this for granted now, but you're training new residents and fellows, and there's going to be this motion. And the simple question, and I, I, I'm not trying to be pedantic here, but the simple question you're trying to answer, did you come up and put your hands on a pathologic normal, you know, normal position, anatomic position, and when you did this, take it to the position of pathology, or did you come up and put your hands when it was in the pathologic or injured position and return it towards normal? That's a whole different thing. And they feel similar when you're new at it. And whether you know the difference, I contend, and people disagree with me, that there's just an incredible amount of information you just gathered. And you'll turn around and, and say, that's interesting. The pelvis is part of this picture. We ought to take care of her. This one needs our attention right now to be part of whether they survive or not. And this is a difference in those two. So you, this one's at normal, and when you go like this, you're recreating pathology. This one will probably have some blood in the urine. It'll probably have four or five fractured ribs, a pulmonary contusion. 17% of aortic tears uh, in vehicles happen when you get hit from the side. You always think of it as a frontal thing where you rip from the, you know, the aorta rips off from its tether. You can do it from the side, too. They start to develop a pattern. The C-spine injuries are fairly high in these. I mean, a C23, and I alluded to the fact yesterday that the real bad C-spine injuries of these are dead at the scene and go right to the pathology, you know, right to the morgue. You don't have much to offer them. That will change when that patient hits about 75 or 80 and all the watershed of the internal iliac is covered with plaque. And we talked about that yesterday. And it acts like PVC pipe. So something that's ordinarily not too pathological in a 25 or 30 year old, you fill it with PVC and we allude to, you know, um, not just superior gluteal as when things come this way, but uh, iliolumbar lateral sacral. Alexis. This is the motorcyclist, the other guy. He's, you come up, you put your hands on the pathologic position and return it to normal. We've got something to offer there. And what we offer is a stabilization and return to a non-pathologic position. And we, we put a lot of attention to return of volume, you know, one-third pi r cubed, uh, hemisphere, and other, and, you know, bony bleeding cessation. Uh, a lot of us, as time goes by, are convinced that's Besides some of the value of that and the internal value of doing this on an external bleed, some of that value is gotten by stabilizing the clot. Because the next, depending on the maturity of an EMS system, the next half hour or so, the patient will be moved several times. And what you don't want to do is shake that first clot loose, I'm convinced. Physical exam is strange. Th these, the reason these slides are historic is we're still making the same mistakes, mistakes and that is the last line. When you start to do research on these, you just hope that you've documented everything, and a lot of times we haven't. And the rectal and GU still is done most of the time, kind of, sort of, but not always. And uh, neuro exam, a lot of patients are sick and can't respond, but you need to get down as much as you can. Um, an old film, but that, and we alluded to some of this yesterday. You're going to see, this will show you of a case that you brought yesterday. And th those distances were almost twice that at the time of impact. So when you see your first AP pelvis, it's at a resting thing. Nowadays, what I want you to answer is, as your binders and other ways of managing this go out into the field providers, I think you owe and shock trauma owes, and maybe we do, a new way of assessing a pelvis radiographically and, and by CAT that has already been bindered. In other words, as it's passing through to get more information, how do you assess a pelvis where you really are scared or shouldn't deconstruct what they've got holding their pelvis? They've been grossly hypotensive in the field. They responded to the early application of a binder, and now you're imaging them with that in place. What clues should we be looking for? There are some, but we haven't figured out yet. 
These were the traditional ones we got. Um, I don't know, we've been manipulated by some of the literature. And a lot of now is, is done with, you know, um, pan scanning. And these things that have to be requested. I'm suggesting if you have a, uh, you should evaluate your institutional x-ray protocols. They will change. If you learn the harbor view method, you're learning from the top of the heap. You're now going to become associate chief or chief of trauma when you leave here. And um, one of the early things to do is say, how does Acme General Hospital evaluate? What's its protocol? You would think it would go just by the American College of Surgeons. They don't. They're, they vary with each hospital. And I'll go back here. So we're looking down at these, at these views. This happens to be an inlet. But once I see that, Dr. Obvious takes over, and I'm pretty sure this guy's been hit from the side in one way or the other. And the x-rays we get called down to see, um, your sophisticated ER here, not always the case. They will never mention the rear. And what happens is your eyes go back, and you have the folks training you how to assess films here. Your eyes go back, and you do a certain process or checklist of elimination, and often predictable patterns of some kind of quick bend or whatever come, on, come up. I haven't won the battle in Texas yet, so even when we get our more sophisticated films, an un uncon uh, um, unconscionable amount of them already have die, and we haven't interrupted uh, the flow. And um, this is urged to put die in everything and uh, do the blocking of posterior information. How we communicate with each other. I, I, I raised this as a point yesterday. Okay, that's, that's a virgin front. That one got clocked a little bit and compressed. So that's a normal SI, let's say. Now that, that question comes in this, what is this? Is that, an op is that an open SI? It was described yesterday a couple of times as an open SI joint. I contend that it's not on this, I mean, another doctor obviously crushed it, and the iliac wing or fragment of it flew back to its normal position. The issue is on, on acute trauma treatment, we don't have many places that are getting MRIs. That's something to be done later. But some of the projects out of Baltimore show that, in fact, um, you know, if you look here, this, this ligament is actually intact, and, and it's what you expect. It goes in, crushes it, and falls back, and often is well within the stretch limits of, of a ligament that's there. So it's technically intact. And so if, to go back, uh, if you're describing these to a, a colleague, um, I would keep that in mind. How you verbally discuss it is your choice, but I think, I think that's an interesting but minor point. Uh, Jeremy Young was a, uh, or is a radiologist. He's now uh, in Charleston, uh, South Carolina. And uh, he liked Guinness, and so did I, and there was a refrigerator in that x-ray room. So after hours, this is when we would run through these films, and we just, and we had Marv's thing in front of us, and we liked the way he thought about that, and we were overwhelmingly getting into this car crash stuff. That's the cop's car I showed you there, because I just used that picture again and again. But that's beginning to take apart the car. And we, we talked about how that was how that was hit, and that guy was a little bit compromised because his front end was down. So you see his, he didn't involve in the protection of the f car frame, and he was a little asymmetric in getting hit from the side. He had a, a, ma a major pelvic fracture. He died of his chest injury. He was the guy I told you about yesterday was, you know, Kevlar vested and a bunch of other stuff, and we still t tore his aorta and tore a large chamber of his heart. We got him, thing came through his chest, the front of that, got his pelvis, and then got his chest to right when it was in the filling cycle and ruptured a ventricle, I believe. But we started looking at him in, in vehicles. The, the lateral compression family always had one of these in the front. It could be on the contralateral, ipsilateral side. There could be, it could have been buckled a bit. But almost all of them have a, have a transverse component that leads you to a s successful read of the back. You'll look like the smartest kid in the room when you go to a place that's done less volume of trauma, when you consistently point out that although not seen by many, even the subtle ones are, uh, you know, indicate lateral compression. Sometimes it's not so subtle. And uh, then you have what has been a, f uh, uh, let's say you've got three passive ones in a row where you think, I'll best do nothing. It's not that bad. And then you have one like this, and you follow it all the way through, and your protocols for that will change depending on your trauma system. We had this lateral compression type 2, and it had a small subset that cracked through the ilium and it, left it behind. It leaves this crescent of bone. Now, this crescent is not a sign of any type. It can happen in a vertical injury or a couple others. But one of the versions of this, this lateral compression type 2, has always hit from the side. They also have often blood in the urine and the, and the sequelae of being hit from the side. Um, they, uh, 
the ligaments are intact, and that's what the illustrator was trying to show you here. And so you can take advantage at times of, of having an endpoint if you go like that and returning it to normal anatomy, whether you do it with an external fixator or screws or plates or some combination of both spread over time. Then we had, you had a patient like this yesterday. There was obviously a set of folks that got really hit hard or, and we'll show you, hit by a flat fronted vehicle or crushed at a construction site where their first impact is a lateral compression, but then they stay trapped. Most pedestrians, as we talked about, do a flight over the hood or the roof. If you're hit by a flat fronted vehicle, you're launched out in front of it usually and then secondarily mounted and kind of run over. That's where some of the Morel lesions come from. That's where some of these L3, LC3 comes from. And it started as a lateral compression on one side. And that traverses, a, and remember, even yesterday, do you, do you remember where the positive angiographic findings were? The more obvious injury was where the sacrum got crushed. The place it was losing blood was on the other side where the, the watershed took a tensile hit. And that's where that patient was bleeding. <clears throat> so that's where that came from. And that's um, an MRI of that crush on one side, remember ligament attack, and true open book on the other, even though this may, when you're looking at this on a plain film, that may look more subtle. But that's where the money is. And remember, to be there on the resting gantry, it was probably twice or three times that distance at the time of the hit. And many of our gantries, depending on your protocol, has them dismounted. It could be even more. They're dism dismounted from the backboard. They're in the gantry now, and they're slightly reduced by the curve of the gantry, and it understates this sometimes. Flat-fronted vehicle number. And these are whatever you need to drop plumb bobs or straight lines down through and, and see this type of hit, crush on one side, open book on the other. The open book family is everybody's, I think this term's been around for years, decades and decades. It's nothing new. But this is this family where this anterior-posterior compression. Marv and George suggested some of this can come from the back or the front, and I think it can, but a lot of them use these families is fairly common to all of us. This I find almost none of. You've got Jim Kellum in one of Marv Tile's early texts examining somebody, and if you talk to some of them, there's this stretch. Many of them are males with sporting injuries being checked hard into the boards. None of these guys admit to recent childbirth, but what they did have was a good heavy check, and they had an endpoint. Symphysis is a bit wide, they got some back pain, and they, they seem, and I think that family exists, although I, st I look for them all the time. There's, there's not very many out there. The open book is now the analogy. The first one, you were struggling to get a diary open with a little latch in the front. Now you've got it open, and you open and you read. The hinges work and the binding of the book's intact. That's an AP2, we decided to call it. It's Jeremy and me, Guinness Stout, and a book of a bunch of x rays. And it had to, by definition, rip the, those anatomic elements, the, uh, those around the symphysis, those in the floor of the pelvis, and the anterior SI ligaments. So the old film that shows that. And we alluded, we found what a clue on one patient yesterday. Do you remember? The LC3 on the side that was open. And we wondered, gee, that looks like it's not so bad, but that's where he had that clottable bleed, and when you looked at it carefully, he'd ripped off part of a sacrum. He ripped off this part of a sacrum, and that's, that's a visual clue. Now, most of these are mid-substance in the ligament, so you don't see this, and that's why this film has a, you know, is uh, from the years of the Great Depression, because sometimes you get such a good, clear uh, radiographic signature, you want to, you know, park it in time, but it's a good teaching point, I think. That's what you got to rip through. So the fact that you're coming down and reading crits and stuff like that and saying, I think this person probably has a venous plexus or something going on there. I, you, you've looked everywhere, you can't find his bleeding, and there's some sign that these ligaments or this continuity of the pelvic ring has been destroyed in him. You cannot think that he got all those soft tissue elements and didn't rip the veins in some, some form. From the back, you see how this binding can be a pretty thick book. So if you really destroy the continuity of, of this book analogy and rip the binding, that's, you've torn through significant tissue. So that's the AP2. The open book, the hinge stays intact. But the posterior ligaments remain, and it does the book analogy. Now, you've now opened the diary, and the analogy I used to use in all the lectures was you've read about what your little sibling said about you, you got ticked off, and you broke, broke the diary into two parts over your knee and you ruin the binding. And that's what this is, this AP3. It starts in this 
a little bit of force to get you to an AP2, but then a large force and you continue the tearing process and it parks the hemipelvis off in position B. That, that patient's the one sick. I know I'm repeating myself, but yesterday a couple of us said, oh, I'd type them across them for six. Somebody said for 10. But when you see them parked out there, we get busy. That's our fellow. And just to let you know you're not the only one with this finding, this is another ejected patient. You remember your presented case yesterday where we went back and read and said, gee, that, that looks pretty severe. They are. And uh, this one, by the way, that's why I asked the, neuromus the neurovascular function of this extremity. This one was not intact. And, had, and the patient, as I remember, was conscious and could tell us that, which is unusual. Usually, you get hurt that bad, you're not conscious. Vertical shear. I like the way of thinking of this way, and then we just brought it over from the Toronto classification. It turns out a couple things when, you're, when you have jumping histories or jumping out of fire or falling on an industrial site. About 50% of people that jump and get a pelvic injury stay vertical on the way down. The other half fall and get an acetabular fracture, usually on their side, sometimes intrusion. So, so it, not everybody comes straight down. And then we're going to see the mirror image of this. I'd like the world over the, this is the fifth anniversary of something, of a pretty severe earthquake, and I'll show you the pattern of pelvic fractures that came out of Haiti. And if vertical shear is landing on one, trying to exit a natural disaster or a mine cave in where your environment is coming down on you is the mirror image. But now your fixed point is your, your weight-bearing extremity in mid-gate, and your body is pushed down around it instead of jumping out of a building and having your, your extremity pushed up into you. And I'll show you that pattern. 1980s, late 80s, where finally the, it, we show that the classification by mechanism is key. What the fun thing here was the amount of people that disagreed and published articles challenging this over the years. And I actually find that healthy. That's the way academics should go. I still believe in this, but we took our hits. And my claim is there's, there's something there still. And I can tell injury patterns, whether it, this was 1,300 you know, radiographic exams and or 300, uh, 350 in this case, um, pelvic ring and acetabular fractures that we went over. Uh, the claim is the fracture patterns are predictable if you know the mechanism, and the pelvic injury serves as a marker. And I think we showed that. This is the one I used yesterday to show you. I'm going to repeat it with a little more detail. But this is one where you, f you finally get the scene in Alan Jones' case from years and years ago. And you rarely see this in lectures, and that's why it reappears and reappears, because that gives you an idea of what you're dealing with. And when you claim, I'm not, he doesn't seem to be bleeding too much when he came in the door, there may be a reason. That may have already happened, and, and most of his blood has exited stage left. And uh, he's arriving in a far more agonal state. And look, if we look back, um, blood pressure was 90, so he was a male that took this pretty well. He's fairly sick. He's intubated. Single AP film looks pretty bad. We postponed the cat until we got a binder on him. Used the assets of the institution at that time. That guy came into the newer building at Shock when we had an immediately adjacent cat scan and angio suite, and so we could get to that pretty quick. Back then, even we were beginning to have our problems evaluating the cat scan if the binder was on. What did it mean? We used both the, the packing and the application of the binder. Learning early stories here about how much to trim off so that <clears throat> we don't get too much of this. And that it, and as you, I alluded to that before, that actually can serve as a block to the last few centimeters of thing. And one of the advantages of the sheet over the binder is, uh, is, is this, this is one of the side effects of that. Um, but now, either way would have a problem, whether it's cutouts to get access for angiography or laparotomy, or cutting holes in a sheet. That step can be covered. For a sheet, you cut holes. For a binder that I use, you set, put a second binder over the thighs and tape the legs together, and whatever, you can keep the pelvis reduced. So we're, we now, we've helped <coughs> hemodynamics with the application of some kind of clamp in the form of cloth or Velcro. We've made it possible to continue the workup, the diagnostics and treatment by gaining access to the belly and the, and the uh, arteries as they exit the pelvis. But now the third one comes in. What about the perineum? And now that, where does that fall in your, 
in your time? Is it going to happen in an hour, in three hours? Do you need to get him to the ICU and get him stabilized and put that off for a while? If he's going to the OR for anything else besides the debridement of this as a septic focus for a day or two away, what you need is you, you're about to go into his belly or do something else in the OR. The information you're going to get from his perineum will also indicate how much you need to divert the colostomy, and I think that's where that came from. And that's, we talked about that yesterday too. So the feet and knees taped together, we're going in the crest. This is a clamp we had made for this. There's three pins because you hope the two are in there. That's why there's three. A lot of work went into a paper. This was Renner Johnson. I don't know if Ted remembers this. It's proving that two were enough. Well, if the pel pelvis is skeletonized and you put two in perfectly, the third one asks, adds almost nothing. If you can guarantee me that in the heat of battle, all your pins are going to be in where you think they are, you're probably fibbing. And so by putting in three, you hope that two have gained good purchase in there. And that's why the three was chosen. And the other mistake we made, very short time, but a bunch of other people too, is we took somebody's clamp and then tried to put them in the same line the clamp had us. Well, the pelvis didn't read the anatomy book of the clamp and vice versa when they got it together. So each pin is put in independently in these fixatures, and then you make the clamp fit the pin, because the pins are fitting the contour of the pelvis. Talked about a couple of things. When you're totally disrupted in the hemipelvis and you bring it together in the front, it will make it worse in the back. Well, don't do that. And this is, this is the reduction maneuver for these, which is a lot of push on the back. Just trying to return the pelvis. Then the, and the frame, you saw that big mama frame on the front. The frame grows. We take nothing we did was original. We copied from everyone. And that one, I, th I think it was a fin, pier slattice and the pars, pars lattice. And we, he uh, put this on with a uh, turnbuckle in the middle to try to get it to work like a set of ice tongs. We found the actual. Uh, trapezoid of it. Uh, if you go back to that clamp, this is what we were thinking. I'm, I'm not claiming this was the right thought. You see there's two pickup points on the external side here, one here and one there. And th this, this fellow is going to get two trapezoids eventually. So that if we've won the political battle of let orthopedics in first, I can't then block access for the general surgeons. Remember, they're overreading the belly at this time in the late 70s, early 80s. Anything in there is probably blood in the peritoneal cavity. And we're telling them, I've seen your patient. I've examined him myself. I think it's retroperitoneal. If you go in and just do what you've been trained to do, just open them and search. You've got to put yourself in a few decades ago. We're going to make this worse. And we saw that happen time and time. So as we won the political battle, let us control the pelvic environment first. This trapezoid of slate is converted to access to the abdomen and things. So you could take, keep one tight. Take the second one and put it, drop it down over the thighs, retighten that one, and then remove the top one or put it up over the thorax. So they're operating in the belly in a stabilized musculoskeletal environment. And the change there was pretty remarkable for us. You can see this is not a great reduction, but <clears throat> what we got. Uh, we alluded to the lithotomy position. This is another patient we'll talk about later, but I needed a thing to just illustrate that that allowed us to get this guy at some time in for examination of his perineum. And once again, we're in control of the packing. The first was put in by EMS. I know general surgery is sort of in charge here, but uh, none of us would accept uh, to that day that they're t totally in charge of this uh, exam. We want to be there too. So we're doing the rectum or the remains of it in this guy, v vagina if it's a female patient, and then all paths to bone in there. Uh, and then repacking ourselves usually. Um, <clears throat> So schedule for a second visit. That's that guy's wound. You see some grass in there and some other stuff. It doesn't look half as bad as it looked in the field. So once he's sort of straight on a backboard, he looks a little better. That's an awful reduction, but that's after we monkey around with it, that's what we got. And the eventual um, reconstruction of the pelvis with the state of the art of, that, of those days, I think we could all critique that. But... Um, it was what we had, and we got to this point with the fixator on and still remained unreduced in the back, even though we had pushed there. And um, then uh, in those days, that was, a, that was a big event for us to get all the way across with a nail. I don't think with many patients' skill set, that would be a big event today. But, and um, a plate in the front, uh, knowing that the infection rate had a big chance to be high, just to get the anatomy right. And, and early, the plate got removed fairly early. I think by about eight weeks, it was out of there because we had an infection problem up front, but we took it for what we got. And that was the eventual reconstruction of that guy. Open pelvic fractures were 
thing. You can see us in the early days not knowing where to put pelvises, and this will come back to, to bite us a little bit as we get into our people coming out of Afghanistan and these IEDs. Uh, and, and one person, and you yesterday, I think you remarked that, that, uh, that you, why did you choose, you know, you're the question and answer with the residents, why did you choose that? Because that person was wounded there. But this is in the middle of that scene. Although this is around 1981 or so, to 81, 82 in there, in that picture. So we're, the, these injuries were fairly unusual for us, and uh, they stay with you forever. So control the hemorrhage and open fracture, stabilize the pelvic ring. That's where we're headed with this. That, a lot of time, that's the same thing, to breathe the wounds and divert if you have to. My th way of thinking was associated open wound, a tensile perineal tear, or an implosion injury, which is what we saw with one of our female patients yesterday. Obviously, the tamponade's extremely compromised. So anything you say, put on a binder and you bring uh, things back to the same. If, if you still have a hole in the bottom of the flask, it's going to bleed. So it's a combination of um, bringing the flask back together and using packing. At this time, interventional angiography was not um, available. This is a female version of that. Originally left all the wounds open, started closing them around the mid-80s and uh, bringing them back and either reopening them or inspecting them formally at 48 hours. Um, we were leaving all open wounds open that didn't work as well in the pelvis, but also we never ever assumed that a wound that was closed was going to stay closed. Very often that meant it was going to be reopened and we would debride it again, but we started closing there. Just, uh, just it worked better in the uh, dressings of the day and keeping uh, as clean as they could if they hadn't been diverted, etc. And you see that female's got one of those double stacks on her there. And, um, and, um, and you can see that's her ostomy right there. This is what we were talking about. This is an intrusion into the wall, the, the vaginal wall, and getting a fixator on and pushing it outward because this is a lateral compression injury. And you push it out when you finally get it. In the beginning, you put the fixator on, you put a speculum inside, and you, you examine the inside of the vaginal wall, and then you actually recreate very gently the pathology. And in, in from the wall comes this spicule of bone, and you ronjure it off and irrigate the hell out of it. And irrigate that wound. OB is at your side, giving you better uh, exposure, if you will, and then you reduce it out. And depending on the size of the wound or the rent, you might put a, a drain in and a single uh, single stitch and just advance it a centimeter a day. It's two or three days and it's gone. And my claim is that treating the pelvis for that injury that way, um, they the short numbers we had. Once again, I'm repeating the inf our infection rate went way down, although the numbers are low. So it's not really a rate; it's a storytelling, you know, and and the pain meds went way down, the need for pain meds. And most of these patients, when they get hit that hard, have some pulmonary injury and are getting the kind of therapy that requires them to be rolled in bed. And it's a much more comfortable when that's done. And they do better. And you use the ligaments, because the ligaments, remember, are intact. So you park it like that, and then your partner tightens up the frame, and you keep it distracted. This is what I'm suggesting should be recorded. If you have that thought, this should be in your in whatever you, when you leave the OR with your uh, image intensifier records, you should have it in normal, and then with your, you can see somebody's hands on that, pressing it in on the, on the shot in the middle, and um, we recorded that's, that's what part of the injury was. And also had it part of the, so you had that, our physical exam. In the record book, we have the dye that was in the bladder and it's intra or extraperitoneal rupture, and then the cat, and you go through what what that patient may need to fix that. And that's in, in your wheelhouse and you're advanced, far advanced in that compared to the rest of us. But diagnosing it is what uh, I found interesting and treating it with that, um, that introduction of the bone fragment into the back of the wall. Associated image hemorrhages is the big problem for most of us. Hypotension in the polytrauma patient comes out of six, place, six places pretty soon within 20 minutes or so after arrival, you're going to have this information, and most of the time, hypovolemia is a player, although not the only one. There's sort of six things in the literature uh, that they talk about, six uh, treatments. There are five sites of the hemorrhage. Orthopedics is involved in three of those, if you will, external, extremity, and extraperitoneal. So we're already coming in the environment of that resuscitation bay, one of the major players, and that's why if you can afford it, uh, you know, to get some senior folks down there on some critical cases is a good signature to leave in your hospital. And Ted talked about yesterday, has, has 
the attending vascular trauma and orthopedic surgeon talk to one another. And that's critical in these kind of complex cases. If you can, if you're not scrubbed, you can make it down for them. Three, three of the methods have sort of gone the way, but this is what used to be listed in the textbooks, and this is the, the, our East Coast way of looking at this. Exploration ligation, I was brought up that that was a viable method. It was a real bad idea, and once you quickly read the literature, you realize that somebody in a, in a wastebasket was talking about pelvic fractures, and they would include blunt and penetrating injury in a pelvic fracture and how to control bleeding, and, and obviously they're grossly different things, and they... And if you really read it down, this whole thing of exploring it and going in and clamping a vessel was about the penetrating wound. It didn't play very well in uh, blunt injury. Mass trousers came and went. They got a bad rap. So uh, they came out of Vietnam, and they were the military anti-shock garments. And those are the ones you see sort of historically now with big balloon pants and over the lower extremities and across the midsection. And there were protocols on how to take took them out too fast, it'd be like removing a pelvic binder. And so the protocols around that developed in how many large bore lines you had to have in and how many people at bedside. If you started deflating it in the wrong author, they, drop, they were going to drop their pressure head pretty significantly. And um, they got a bad rap, I think, because in Houston, Texas, where I am now, in Ben Taub Hospital, they were being put on penetrating gunshot wounds above the diaphragm, chest and ever, to resuscitate. And it turns out they act like a seed, if you will, and they hasten the exsanguination of a stab or, or bullet wound to the aorta or one of the major vessels. They actually hasten. They're pumping all the blood up north to get shock, and they're kind of you know, accelerating the exsanguination process. So therefore, they must be bad. So lost in that literature that came out in EMS literature because Ken, a fellow named Ken Maddox had a lot of power was the fact they were damn good air splint or binder. And so that they float away as a worthless piece of crap, and they're not. I, I don't use them, and there are better ways to do it, but they got a bad rap when somebody once again mixed blunt and penetrating trauma and tried to you know, assign them the same way of doing them. Immediate internal fixation got a couple of, uh, I'm sorry, a couple of, uh, a, a couple of papers written about it, but immediate and, uh, fixation there was within 48 hours. And I would suggest that's not immediate anything. That's what we now consider a sort of uh, reconstruction. Um, so it's, we're left with um, interventional extraperitoneal packing and pelvic fixation and external stabilization, uh, which I, I would consider acute pe pelvic stabilization. And everybody wants to argue about whether that should be cloth or Velcro or metal. I'm not sure that's worth the argument. There, it's going to be what your institution and what you're used to, I think. This was suggested in some of the papers about immediate internal. Um, some of these approaches have not stood the test of time, nor has some of the hardware and its complications. Um, and uh, we would not do this uh, for a number of reasons. We're quickly taught that you don't want to decompress the retroperitoneum in that first short space if you can avoid that. And some of this is big decompression of the retroperitoneum. Some of it is suggesting positions that no patient being worked up and still uncleared with their spine or anything else can tolerate, let alone um, make incisions the size that, that this was. Honest, Your Honor. I'm not. So it, it turned out to be a bad idea. But one of the homes of another way of doing that is here. And it depends upon what you call immediate internal fixation. And I would suggest that if you relook at that from what your skill sets are now, it makes sense. You have emergent accurate percutaneous internal fixation. <coughs> And the radio readily available resources may change this. You, may, you know more about this than I do as far as what your institution's current strengths are, but there may be a time when the, the next Harborview has enough radiographic equipment where this becomes part of a resuscitation where, like, intubating a patient to control the airway. <coughs> you may come up with a computer-generated aiming system on a gun and throw somebody's SI joint back together acutely with a small wipe. It also may not happen. <coughs> But if you accept that there's a resuscitative SI reduction that doesn't go for perfect geometry and the patient needs it for other reasons and you take it and you say, if he makes it, we'll come back and <coughs> either accept the malreduction a little bit or we'll redo him. But we bought him that first night and we aided his resuscitation. This was our version of a binder and also let our colleagues get into it, the perineum and the belly and a bunch of other things that we didn't put a bunch of hardware out in front. And you have a resuscitation screw. So I'm suggesting in that way it may come back. 
everybody's looking at this stuff. Some carry it too far, some, uh, but it's out there. Interventional angiography. You're at one of the homes. There's a fellow, anybody know or remember your, Ben Menachem um, when he was here? He, I first met him in Houston in 82. And then he was a problem to us. He's a good friend and I co-published with him along when he was here. But he and a guy named Sal Sclafani were the country's pioneers. Yoram Ben Menachem, I think, was a tank commander in one of the Israeli wars. He had a pretty good military history. Showed up in Houston. He's an interventional angiographer with the mind of a surgeon and was that aggressive. And at Herman Hospital, when I first visited them with Bruce Brown, or we went down and saw it as a couple of guys in the 81, 82, everybody coming through the door with bad blunt trauma got an angiogram. And the whole celiac axis got run. And and he was aggressive enough, and his fellows were, and he was in the house a lot, and his fellows were there, and they would <coughs> do their magic and tell you, the spleen's got this, the liver's got that, you have a mesenteric artery, and one of your pelvic branches, number six, is out. But much hemorrhage is venous. Even his literature shows that when he squirted everybody from fairly high energy blunt trauma by history, about 14% had arterial bleeds. That's all. <coughs> the majority of the bleeding in there was venous. Um, he and Sclafani set standards, and here's where it came to be a pain in the butt for all of us nationally. Your general surgery colleagues, especially in the East, had, run, uh, had read this literature a lot and said, we're going to wait for angio. Now, Sclafani at Downstate, Ben Menachem in Houston, and then Seattle were there. They were available. They talked on the phone to their colleague. The rest of the world, that hadn't happened yet. And we were waiting for a dream that never came. The, the call to the angiographer, the argument, do you really need to do that? How about the morning? Do I have to get out of bed? And so time was going by, and we hadn't gained political strength enough in Baltimore to go and say, let me at them. Let me tie a sheet around them. Let me put a binder on or an X fix. Let me get at this patient. Uh, we're gonna, first things first, baby. And we were telling them that this needed orthopedic attention fairly quickly, and we were losing the battle. Also, the issue of whether the blood loss was, uh, was intra or retroperitoneal. And so then politics take over. And what ours, I'm just letting you know what ha was happening in Baltimore. I had a partner named Attila, and he looked like and acted like an Attila. So we bullied people around. And we sort of took over the, took over the room, if you will, and said, no, let us close. And all the first deck fixes and bindings and stuff that were done in Baltimore we're, we're done under threat of physical harm. And so, um, just closing the door there. That, so there's nothing like a good old old fashioned roughing up, you know, and Attila was Hungarian and he was used to that. And, and we took control. And the second thing we did, we scrubbed on every belly exploration, just to be obnoxious enough to say, aha. And we're going in and the, re and the peritoneal space is fairly clear, it looks like, shit, because from the back is this pressed up retroperitoneal bleed. And now you're kind of strutting your stuff. You know, I told you, you idiot. And then all of a sudden, you start to get called earlier. Hey, we, this is a bad pelvic fracture, and maybe some positive. Fun. We need to call ortho. And it, it, uh, this is the history of, of how we got ourselves in there, being, sort of being obnoxious. And then we talk about, I talk about DNA. The first few that were put on, we started putting X fixes on the ER. Maybe a little too much drama, but it worked for us. But the first few of these done by an attending team. So in their mind, they had this application was fast and efficient. It was by the pros from Dover, and they knew what they were doing. And so the signature of orthopedics becomes one of strength. And I, I'm getting a little corny here, but that's what I mean. You've got it here. And, and you need to maintain that. Those of you that are going to do careers in trauma, wherever you go, just sh you know, half a life is showing up. It's really true. Maybe useful adjunct to other methods, but the angiography suite is a hell of a place to resuscitate. And if you haven't fixed them, a lot of our bumpy journeys when we would move them onto the angiographic table, plop them down, start to move the machine over, and we hadn't been stabilizing the pelvis, and then be the pitter-patter of little house staff running sphincters all akimbo because this guy has just dropped his pressure head while you put him on the table first thing. So the thing you're starting with is a guy coding for the second time, and remember the second hit of hypotension is lethal. He's coding under the machine, exactly the opposite of what you want. I'm going to leave that there uh, for a second. So I got pretty cocky and bragged about how I could tell your mechanism and, and that uh, if you were lateral compression, you didn't need to bleed. And then 
uh, uh, we talked about the elderly. The spectrum of vision is slightly narrow. They drive out into harm's way. There's more of them behind the wheel, and they're getting T-boned at, at a fairly increasing rate. And we mentioned plaque yesterday. I want to reinforce that. The watershed of the internal iliac, now plaque filled at age 80 or 78 or whenever, does not act as compliant as, as the 30-year-old getting T-boned. It acts like PVC pipe. And lumbar arteries that ordinarily wouldn't think about bleeding now consider it quite heavily because their plaques involved. They, they snap a little bit. So if an elderly patient's going down and your workup is still negative, and it, three patients ago you might not have pushed for early angiography in that particular patient, but now it's attached to someone with some years on them. Go earlier to angio in the elderly too. You're going to find it valuable and otherwise benign. Most of their fractures are low energy and don't do this, but if they've gotten hit pretty good, you should jump earlier on that. And I think it's a good method of the resources are available. That's the key. And the question was getting by this myth. We actually published one out of Houston. I'm not sure where it'll appear about the difference in angiography in Houston, Texas, you know, claim with the world's biggest medical center, yada, yada, yada. And, and, um, and we, our differences are notable with a higher death rate at night because our attending angiographers are not in house in this claim, place we claim is the highest volume of. I mean, a fellow is or somebody, but the difference is now in, in print, and I'm, it'll be out Brian Cotton and a few of the rest of us, and I'm not sure where it's going to appear. Extraperineal packing has come and gone and now revisiting us. It's successful at Hanover. That's where I learned about it. Just get in there. Remember, uh, when I went and did my AO fellowship, I took call six nights a week so I could move closer to the table. During the day, uh, Tom Rudy was teaching a lot of folks, and I could watch. I already had my shock trauma fellowship and a couple of years of private practice. So in many ways, that was not bad for me. I was sort of like Velcro. I was an older guy and I could see and he'd get to a point and I, I could do that. I could do, wow. And I'd see his little tricks. But the reason I didn't take a call the seventh night was because it was an orthopod on call on the seventh night. The other six were general surgeons that did musculoskeletal surgery and they had a better feel for some of this stuff. They were very much at home there. Now remember general surgery residency over there at that time was seven or eight or whatever years. So they covered fracture surgery. But our appreciation for packing and going around in there was exemplified by that group. This has trickled back to the states now and is now being reinvestigated. I'm gonna stop for 30 seconds here and tell you something else and that is that some of the fun in this, the politics and the jockeying for other specialties. We always throw pelvis and acetabulum together, right? Now it's pelvis and acetabulum, of course, because it's, it's, we think of the mechanics, the mechanic. The acetabulum, in my mind, is a different beast for one major reason. It's almost all orthopods talking to other orthopods. Whereas pelvic ring disruption, you're in there depending on your, depending on your political forum, you're arguing with general surgeons, ER docs, interventional angiographers, uh, OB every once in a while. I mean, urologists, certainly. And it's a playing field where everybody's got an opinion. It's a much harder playing field to manage the politics of pelvic ring disruption. And if you're in a place and you take over when you leave here that hasn't had strong orthopedic interest for a while, you will fight a prejudice that you don't have a place in it. Jump forward 30 years and packing comes back into the, into the range. It's something a general surgeon can do. An orthopedist may get interested in it. It'll be sure to to um, be more thoroughly investigated. Currently, I think it's uh, in vogue in Denver and a little bit at Mass General. You guys may know more about where we are in the state of the art of that, who's, who's involved in the packing protocols, but uh, it's another reinvestigation of this. Packing by itself is what worries me. It's sort of like the closed version of packing into a perineal wound. If you haven't stabilized the ring, you can pack till, till the cows come out of the barn. The, you're packing into an environment that's getting bigger. You're just stuffing it full of rags. Correctly done, it's okay. If you run the trauma literature, a lot of people now in Europe accept packing as the norm and anything we do orthopedically is sort of a side effect and I'm not comfortable with that. But they, Harold Journey fixed accessible fractures, packed it, and then remember was gonna come back, left the packing in. And so in that was, and I don't find that any fault with this, was a return, automatic return trip to the OR. You exchange your packing or they'd stop bleeding by then. Currently best done by a European trauma surgeon. I mean, if, if you've got that kind of protocol in your hospital, go ahead and do it. External stabilization, immediate application to the patient in extremis, controls volume and therefore tamponade, stabilizes a clot. And that's my contention. I want you guys to pay attention. You may already have an opinion from your leadership on here. I think the volume thing's important. It's nice to chat about. I'm convinced that this clot stabilization is, gets, doesn't get enough credit. 
Our indications are these. Uh, this is a typical case for us in the early days. This is where I have my bone to pick with Harborview, and uh, I'm going to show you how I did this. And I, I have a bunch of your alums who would go to a lecture because this is a real historic picture and say, yeah, they used that in Harborview on how not to put on a sheet. And uh, you're about to see it, so you're going to have to get over it. So there it is. And, uh, ah, sheet. Aha. You should have clamps. You should be able to adjust it. I'm not comfortable with that. You can't get over it. So this is, this, is about, this is the five minutes to get back from the admitting area to the OR. So we're prepping this guy. This is not going to be on any more than five. In fact, in reality, about half an hour. But it's on for a fairly short time. And uh, we talked about a knotted bed sheet and how bad that was. It got us to where we had to go on, on patients like this. And we used whatever we could in the early days, including rolls of tape taping the knees together and the ankles. And that brings you to this thing, and his, 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 uh, this is the stage thing, which I think is sort of popular today. You may or may not do it this way here. Uh, this, this isn't fixed, but this is his binder in place. Now what? Well, he had a lot of injuries. He had, uh, we had missed with the first chest tube. Where we had to reestablish that. And we were thinking of doing a laparotomy, which I think we eventually did not do. Head injuries and some other stuff going on. So we bought some time with the knotted bed sheet. We got him back, and we did what was our state of the art in those days, his history here again, uh, which was a single screw to the back and a uh, fixator, which stayed on him for, I think, six weeks, by the way. <clears throat> Took him from that to that, and uh, with m minimal intervention. And so now the relevant question to me is, and you get back on the playing field, now what, really? This watt is a good watt. We, would st we stopped here at this day and age. The good watt here, is that acceptable anymore? M many, many people, I think the majority, would fix the front and maybe fix it more, st more sturdily in the back. But that was what was developing us, this staged approach to pelvic ring disruption. These are the things we can think. We're, we're here. We're pretty cocky in this thing. Uh, we're a little uncomfortable with being too close to the acetabulum. and probably redirect that over there. Watching it down, these are from uh, uh, Charlie and... Uh, and Adam Starr, and that's from their textbook, and Alan Jones had a part in that in the early days too, showing you what direction you're going. And you can, as you know, I saw the pictures yesterday. You were aware of the same views. I saw them Zeme labeled. We've since become Zemophiles in Houston with the migration of the labor force south with regard to that, and, and uh, we like the quality of their films. This is a multi trauma in Orlando. So a few years go by, and we have the ABCs, they get a binder sheet. And then we stop, and it depends, what are we going to need next? We're going to have to get the angio, a laparotomy, or a perineal debridement, and that's where you start picking. Temporizing X-fix, percutaneous, or definitive fixation. And that's temporary. But you can see here in the lower corner, I think all of us, as you kn knew, found your way to guide your pins in, uh, you found more comfortable that they were in all the way. So one of the nice things is, as you leave your campus here, you're going to take this for granted and we talked about it yesterday, these pelvic interventional moves, you're so well taught here. Uh, and I'm not just schmoozing you and being nice, it's, it's true. This, don't think this is normal, the level of knowledge you're getting to be trained here. But if you decide to go with method A or method B or method C, the thing I'm, I'm proudest of of this place and some of the other places I've been, you'll choose it because you think it's the right thing, not because you can't do the other one. In other words, you can get in safely with a screw. You can put on an X-Fix safely. You can manage a binder safely without killing skin. You can do a few of the things and not add risk to the patient because you've learned the technique. And this is my return. We'll hit it again. Sorry to repeat, uh, but this is this return to the crest. You saw it happen once here with a wounded patient yesterday. And my claim is if you have any time to the military, hopefully we'll be out of there pretty soon to some degree. But you're going to see this in warfare. And our war fighters have been getting more and more fixers put on at the crest. But this is the, firmest, the fi famous, I would say, Baltimore air ball. Swing and a miss. But this is the, we talked about squaring up to your environment. So everything goes in square because there's a wall and there's a thing. And you're going to find musculoskeletal skills of you as an EMS provider, whether you're putting on a splint or drilling a pin under fire with the pressure going down. You start, you, you're losing it. Actually, we know that. And so we designed it. But you really got to think, where the hell is the pelvis? It's out to the side. And if I'm going to put one of these crest pins in, I need to shoot it. And these, were, these teaching techniques were when we were putting them on in the emergency room without radiographic control. 
And that's what we reflected in some of our military ones. These are the two clamps we work with. We talked about the AO clamp. That ended up being mostly a reduction device later on. It did not serve a purpose as an acute device for the reasons I gave you. One, we, we missed, so did everybody else. So everybody's got a picture of the pins meeting in the rectum or somewhere going through the greater notch. or Because you'd, you'd learn on a saw bones and the first biker you had come in was 300 pounds and there was a miss. Also broke down a little skin. Had some other problems. Those that learned to use it well like it, but our biggest problem in the inner city was when it was re-sterilized and returned to the ER, it was never intact. And these are machines that work only when all their parts are in the box. So it, it makes good, you pump it up, I'm full of the, I'm a clamp fan. Oh, it's Saturday night and oh crap. And that's actually what happened to us. This is Bruce Browner's clamp on the bottom, which never really made it to the public thing, but had a bit of advantage. See out here your fixed angle, that might be nice. And Bruce's clamp allowed it to be used a little more anterior if he felt like it, or a little more posterior. Big click, click, click here, and then fine tuning with screwing it on. And that's, that's in Houston in the early 80s, I think Bruce had it there. Um, but it was a nice idea too. Binder. How long skin is it in the way, perineal axis, etc. That's the binders we showed you yesterday. That's position two. That's the amazing amount of these patients and actually was reflected on your case presentation yesterday. Their femurs were intact and if they are and you have a reason to complete a laparotomy, to put in an X fix, to plate a symphysis or to do angio, a second binder and tape and everything together will hold the reduction almost exactly the same it turns out. And this is just us doing that. These are the uh, fixator types, the anterior one that was originally taught to us by Europeans. We abandoned uh, when we couldn't, because in our mind that early fixator was emergent, was going to go on without radiographic control, and we threw a few nasty air balls coming in the front. It is extremely slippery, as you've learned uh, here, and you'll have your own tricks about how you get into the anterior inferior iliac spine of that area to start this sojourn, um, but they're there. And this is our old trapezoid. And this is the side view of getting those pins in and trying to avoid uh, that. And remember, we, some, we talked about incisions a bit and long incisions. These are not a longitudinal, especially on either side, but especially around the malreduced side or the unreduced side. The incisions go to the umbilicus and you almost always cut a path as you're coming up and then have to relieve it and suture behind it. But what you don't do is do a longitudinal incision that you cross when you reduce so that it looks like a railroad track. Fixator evolution, there's some challenging stuff there. We have one faculty member, I related to the, that, in fact, has become a fan of this internal. And the question was yesterday on the massively obese patient, and there, there, is, there they are. Um, he has, his enthusiasm has dulled a little bit uh, because of a complication or two. But I'm suggesting this is one that really benefits from a single user who's a fan and pays very much attention to neuro and potential vascular problems. Um, well, is this the future? Now you're going out as Harborview trained. You'll be generalist, sports medicine, or trauma trained, or hand, or whatever. But you've got this part, you've got this in your signature now. You can't, we expect a lot. Those of us in the rest of the world expect somebody coming out of Seattle training room to know what the hell they're doing. So get ready. And what I'd like you to do is participate in things like pattern recognition. So I'm going to show you a couple patterns. I illustrated the military yesterday. We'll go back to that a little bit. Here's another place. Here's the comfort. We talked about vertical shear injuries and trying to ex exit buildings. This, this ship is parked there. It's uh, been loaned to Operation Smile or something like that in South America. Both its gray and black water tanks were damaged. It's in Baltimore, its home harbor. It's now Portsmouth, but Baltimore in the day, five years ago. Uh, this week, really, it's happened about a week or two ago, the earthquake, and the ship is in there being repaired with a civilian crew of five on it. I think it was January 10th or whatever, the earthquake hit. They get the call before midnight, can you get it to sea? A crew comes in starting around 2 a.m. and they start welding like crazy and they get the thing ready to go in 77 hours, which is pretty cool. This ship was in need of some, you know, a few weeks of repair and they get it and they push it out into the harbor. Civilian crew on this, it's a hospital ship, so it's not U.S., it's USNS, naval ship, unarmed, sort of. Goes out. <laughs> We were protected pretty well, I might add. But, but out to the harbor, and, um, and it gets down on sort of day 10. It's, but it takes almost four days to get it out of there, get out of the harbor, and down it comes. By that time, it can take 350 patients, 1,200 beds, 12 ORs, the world's largest trauma unit. And 
OTA had its act together a little more than the American College. So even with the imperfections of getting everybody credentialed, Bossy and Bone and the guys in the military really did a good job. And uh, the first group was just pure military on board. That
Okay. So first of all, thanks to Dr. Burgess again for being here and sharing your wisdom with us. We really do appreciate you having you here. Yesterday was an awesome day, and we'll have a good morning as well. Also, thank you to Swedish Orthopedics Institute for hosting us today. Um, and, uh, you know, if you missed the... Uh, If you missed the uh, presentation yesterday, they are going to be online on the department website. They're also on the department YouTube page. Um, so um, to introduce the moderators today, Dr. Dunbar and Dr. Norick are two of our faculty over at the U, and we're happy to have them here today. Uh, Christopher Domes is going to get us started this morning. So, Christopher, my mom calls me Christopher. Um, so I'm Chris Domes, R3. Labels, uh, recidivism, if you don't know what that is, you can look it up on Google. It's <laughs> quite entertaining. <laughs> it is spelled correctly. Um, so I'm presenting a 49-year-old male who is involved in a high-speed parachute landing slash crash. Uh, his past medical history is uh, otherwise pretty benign, except for a year prior he had a high-speed parachute crash uh, <laughs> that had a pelvic fracture, right closed femur fracture, extraperitoneal bladder rupture, um, and was fixed at Harbor View uh, by Dr. Rout with percutaneous fixation. And as of uh, his last checkup, it was that eight month he was doing well. This is his eight month checkup films. So you can see uh, I am nail and then some percutaneous fixation in his pelvis. <clears throat> so after his new event, he was brought directly from the field as an ED trauma code. His blood pressure and uh, vital signs are listed there. Base deficit is notable 10.9. Uh, trauma series because they snap that quickly uh, and then call orthopedics say he's got a pelvic fracture and they're on to their next step so they've got a fast scan with ED doing the ultrasound in there and it was positive for blood so very quickly general surgery took him for an emergent x lap and found uh, ischem uh, ischemic bowel and had a 30 centimeter resection um, and left him in discontinuity with an open pelvis or an open abdomen um, he was then taken emergently to the ICU, continued to have some hemodynamic uh, instability. At that point, he had already received six units of, bu of blood, uh, four units of platelets, two of FFP, but was still hemodynamically unstable in the ICU with low blood pressures uh, in the uh, 90s, and it was taken for IR, and where he had a right internal iliac embolized uh, for an aneurysm, but no frank bleeding. <clears throat> After that, as is commonly done here, he was taken for his scans, so final finally getting some imaging. Um, prior to that, there was no CT or x-rays done besides our, our trauma series. <clears throat> so what they find, this is the trauma series. Uh, Kari, you wanna take a stab at what you see there? Yep, so it looks like there's a, if you draw our line here, some vertical instability. Got some bent screws. Um, so his injuries, and I'll should go through the x-rays next, is uh, these were his orthopedic injuries, the left open uh, tib fib, a right closed distal femur fracture, of course, through that hardware that we just saw. Pelvic uh, fracture with a vertical shear component and a sacral U variant through his hardware. They're right associated both column acetabular fracture, symphyseal disruption, and notably he had absent motor and sensory function to the right lower extremity when he came in. When he initially came in, he was uh, talking and alert, but they quickly intubated him once in the trauma bay. And he had some uh, his associated injuries, uh, mesenteric root avulsion, that's what required the resection, the kidney laceration, uh, retroperitoneal hematoma is also up there, hypovolemic shock, acute respiratory failure, and some sequelae of diseases as well. So there's just some uh, 3D uh, uh, ghost images from uh, the CT scan. And a 3D reconstruction, you can see the, uh, the acetabular fracture somewhat here. Ghost images looking, and uh, notably here, 
starting to do preoperative potential planning <clears throat> from these images, uh, available corridors for any other fixation. Looking at the post here and knowing the, the complexity of this acetabular fracture, it's got a relatively uh, low anterior column with a comminuted uh, segmental posterior wall uh, portion. And then a, a sagittal of the spine where you see some focal kyphosis through his hardware representing his U-type variant, <clears throat> making this challenging and also potentially explaining his lower extremity lower extremity uh, loss of motor function. And then his hardware, open tib fib. So our first uh, stop point will uh, initial management and priority of all these uh, injuries uh, in the setting of this, you know, uh, critically ill patient, what, uh, what are people thinking would be start jump off points or starting points to attack him. Would, so this, is a, this is a patient who maybe his pelvis is not going to have have definitive internal fixation for a while. It's, it's, it says a both called mastabular fracture on the right. It suddenly starts to make external temporary external fixation perhaps less a, less attractive. Maybe just comment on how long you leave different external binders in place, especially if you're envisioning it's going to be one, two, three, four, X number of days, uh, as well as any other comments that, that the Domer has laid out there in terms of prioritizing this. Looking for this. Uh, this is a, oh, this is on. Um, I still would address the pelvis first and be, the, as I was addressing it, try to find out what, where the compromises would be. Um, I'm not a big believer in vertical films, you know, to stress up and down. This one I am maybe. Uh, he's got it. He's got up into his solid viscous hits on the right, doesn't he? I mean, that's where his pelvic ring is. Has his right kidney got it too? Yep, right kidney and the retroperitoneum on the right. And the right, yeah. I, I have. I'd be gentle, but I'd be curious as to even though it looks like the hardware is holding on, to get a vertical push in there with him well controlled and be ready for all hell to break loose. Maybe I, I don't know if that pelvis didn't go, even with the metal in, much further than we think it does on, on that. I, I, I think, I'm not suggesting his hemipelvis went up and bumped his kidney, but in fact it may have. Parachutes do some unusual things. You follow their retro, the non-survivors of parachute landings up, and very often it's obvious that the hemipelvis has had quite an excursion, more than you would think. So I'm interested in that info. And then I think if, if that's as messed up as I think it might be, I would allow more risk to creep in. Maybe an X-fix, even if I knew that was going to end up with an acetab, and maybe an X-fix with a modified path that would minimize risk to that. Maybe some early time in the ER to, to, to identify the paths and get an emergent sort of senior team-led redo of percutaneous fixa you know, fixation coming across. Uh, so I. My workup of his pelvis would include mostly of the first exam under anesthesia and then consent to do everything and then start working off that and if, if have a deal with the general surgeons, if surviving, go on to the femur, if surviving, going on to open injuries and stuff. But I, I'm interested in stabilizing that ring pretty quickly because of that little sniff of, he loaded the, that was a right femur too, wasn't it? Yes. yes. So he loaded the femur, broke the <coughs> he did that to his hemipelvis, he's got Visca a visceral injury higher than that, and it's one big, huge path, and you saw it, and I'm being obvious again, his um, lateral process, you know, in the spine. He'd go, and um, so I document as much of that as I could, because I'm about to get aggressive, I think. And besides his pressure making that a, a, a non-issue anyway, I also think his anatomy might say, you gotta be here now if this guy has a chance, I think. And I'm surprised he only had an aneurysm. We found vertical shear injuries. We compared them to AP3s because they both rendered the hemipelvis unstable, and we, that's when we blind. We actually found the vertical shear injuries bled less, and we think it's because you don't examine the non-survivors. So a real big mama vertical shear is, is usually dead. 
you know, a jump from a great height, you, whatever the jokes are about the LD55 floors or whatever. And they don't, you don't see them in the hospital. So the vertical shears that make it, and this might be that guy that's right on the edge, should have died, but he didn't. So, I'm, you know, that's the other thing. Should you go to a, hand out your card, you guys are doing pelvic surgery here, go to like the skydiver club and just say, we're available. And, <laughs> or even for the, from prophylactic screws, I don't know. <laughs> Um, well, the step, uh, the next steps, it took a day for him to be resuscitated, uh, but on hospital day two, he was hemodynamically stable and felt appropriate for the OR, so he went with uh, three groups, general surgery, urology, as well as ortho. Um, ortho, uh, we decided to pursue the open fractures and uh, do some X-fixing of the lower extremities uh, prior to fixing the pelvis and acetabular fractures, so he had a... Um, uh, IND and statically locked IM nail placed in the uh, left open tibia and then X fix the right femur. <coughs> and it doesn't project too well here, but maybe one of the um, juniors can comment on what they think these little vascular channels might be here in fixing a tibia. Anybody? Zahab? You, they, you. Okay. Is there a two? Colin? Can you say the question? <clears throat> so the little vascular channels right here in the front of the tibia. A little lucency. You see those? Not really vascular channels, but. Can you see them? It might be hard. Any idea what those might be? Good job, yeah. Yeah, provisional fixation for the uh, comminuted tibial fracture. Good job. Um, and then uh, his IM nail, and I, and I just. I've got a question for you that I think would be fun for you guys to think about. So why not take it off? And you, when you take this plate off, which most of us do if we're going to use them for help during a case, um, we throw it back in the bone clamp set, right? And the answer, I think, is probably no. And I'm kind of a fan of that. This is a damn bone clamp, and we're but the rules are, and including hospital, because I've tried to win this, it's just kind of an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. We all see that. And if we'd done this with a clamp, we wouldn't have thought twice. <laughs> we're now doing it with a plate. Oh, no, you can't put a plate in another patient. It's a damn bone clamp <laughs> disguised as a plate. But we worship this, and I piss away about 1200 bucks or whatever it is every time I toss one of these. And it's going to come up again. You know it's only going to be in a short term, and it's your indwelling reduction clamp. And if it saves a lot of stripping and all that, I don't want to get into this, but when I see those, I think I'm wasting money. And I, by the way, I do it too uh, all the time. But uh, That was actually the biggest, and I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. We actually wrote this up, you know, Steve and Brad probably came up with this, or Ted, really. Um, it was written up about 10 years ago, and that was their biggest beef was the cost of the, of the plate. Yeah, the well, but most of us, I mean, it was happening in a lot of places, and most folks thought, well, this is just a way of doing business. But... It, remember, it saved us from stripping the hell out of things, and it looked a little weird, but if the, if the altar was taking up periostin that was already in place and stripping it off to gain a better clamp purchase, this makes a lot of sense. But, so my next step is, why don't you just toss it back in the bone clamp drawer? Sure. Oh, no. Yeah. It's like killing the pope. <laughs> <laughs> and here's some uh, radiographs of his, the reduction with his external fixer of his femur. <clears throat> so on hospital day three, uh, continuing, he had respiratory difficulty, DSATs, was found to have PEs, also had a lower extremity and upper extremity weakness, and uh, had a stroke with bilateral hemispheric uh, embolic infarcts. IVC filter was placed at that time. Did they think of what the origin of that was? Not clear. He had a biffle, um, uh, carotid uh, uh, aneurysm, but not dissection. But it didn't look like that was uh, the cause. It's unclear. So moving on to, we, we discussed this a little bit, but the pelvic fracture management, and, and I think we discussed uh, external fixator. Um, but as we've taken care of the lower extremities, any any further comments, Dr. Burgess, on what you think might might be the next steps in the pelvic uh, fracture? No, uh, comments, no. Exam under anesthesia and then mm -hmm. uh, decision. 
I'm an XFIX fan, so I run a little that way and gaining time and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You got the expertise you've got, and there, there could be a real value judgment here. He's staying stable. He's asleep right now. Um, the, the open belly is, is or is not in the way. It's time to pull stuff out. We're here. We've got good people on board, right time of day. Let's go for it. Let's pull the stuff out and redo this, and we have a plan. Well, we don't have a plan. We're just finding out the information. He had more dead bowel. It's not a good day. Maybe I put an X fix on him and just try to stay high or whatever my trick was to stay out of the path of the eventual surgery. So I, I never thought about doing an EUA on a vertical shear EUA on this guy. Um, that's an excellent point. I, I guess looking at him, we, well, our treatment initially was placing him in traction, right? That's supposed to be his ass type of his vertical shear component. And I, I thought that his fixation, although bent, was providing a certain amount of splinting to it. So then the question is, and he stayed stable once once he had been resuscitated uh, here at the trauma center. So then the question is, what do we do now for fixation? You kind of implied we take everything out and, and redo it. And, and so the question, go back to one of our original films before these, is you have a bent screw. And I've never taken a bent screw out of a sacrum. And I guess my question is, in terms of like a windshield wiper effect, what would you do to the inside of it? Would you damage more? Uh, would you completely carve out the corridor that you would otherwise use? I, I don't think so. I've only taken out one, and it was in a place that didn't worry me. But um, I've had more than a couple, but I've only taken <laughs> I've taken one out. The rest, I just hide the x-rays in the trunk of my car. But the, the, um, <laughs> but the ones where I've, had, I've backed one out, and it, it, was, it was in a wide enough corridor where it didn't present effect. But that's one of the reasons I'm kind of suggesting. Now you have two combos of info, just the way. The vertical push-pull a little bit. And I'm, I'm not trying to sell push. I think they were oversold, by the way. But in this particular case, and you have a sense of windshield wipering or whatever might have happened at the moment, acute windshield wipering of the screws. So now you have a sense how their, is their path intact and did they adjust a bend? Did they cut a cusp and was the pelvis, did it move a whole lot more than we thought? And the old man's worry about if it went up and bumped the kidney or went north for a bit, is that, am I overstating and being over dramatic? You now, I, I think that's a, a sizable bit of info. And uh, I've done a couple of these. I don't know how he monitors out, by the way, and he's obviously lost some function on this side. But I've done a couple of high-risk things back here and monitored them simultaneously, monitored them neurologically. If I was in a compromised situation with hardware tickling roots that I had placed or something, I'm trying to correct things. So a bit of my experience is from trying to correct a mistake that I've made and <coughs> monitoring while I altered it. Not, never quite as dramatic as this, but so you're, you're, you're unscrewing it and you're watching your neuro monitor if, if you think after you collect that information. So going, going through these uh, CT scan axial cuts, you can see he's split down the middle. So, and, and he has a type of sacrum that you're not going to get anything transiliac, transsacral on the first corridor. So go back. And then your second corridor is your only path to cross the fracture plane has a bent screw in it. And I did worry about take, trying to take out a bent screw in but are you going to need the other access points to do this U? I mean, the U type is a big, uh, to be doc, to be obvious, a big. This is a, this is really a complex set of circumstances. Yeah, he has a U type with kyphosis and uh, with a plan for decompression. With, with a what? With a plan for decompression at that kyphotic sacral level. Um, I, I'm. Do you do you find a corridor here that will take care of both? Uh, the only corridor would be the second corridor and it has a bent screw in it that I was worried about either causing damage, taking it out, or getting it stuck while I'm trying to take it out. Well, Baltimore boy, put on your big boy pants and get the screw out of there. <laughs> That's <not> damn right. <laughs> so, so we opted for something different. <laughs> so in hospital day four, he's taking with the spine team for a lumbar pelvic fixation with the resection of the retropulse bone as well as a uh, reduction of his uh, kyphosis. <clears throat> oh, the other. That, that treated both things in our yeah. mind. So that treated the uh, spinal pelvic uh, instability as well as the sacral pelvic ring instability, at least I thought. 
And this is the Mac to your PC to Mac version here. Now could you go? Um, could you hit that lateral again? Yeah, there's an AP there too that we can splice. No, out I'm, I'm. Okay, I was just looking for the sacrum and how that straightened out. Uh, and that way. <laughs> yeah, I, I get you, but I'm. Okay, looks. I mean, look, it's vastly improved, isn't it, from the U type? Yeah, I mean. Yeah, mm -hmm. good, Dr. Good. Bell Barber did a great job of uh, correcting most of the kyphosis as well as decompressing that. Once again, the PC to Mac version here. Um, so on hospital day five, he was transferred uh, to the floor from the ICU. And on hospital day eight, he was uh, given the good to go uh, for his next orthopedic surgeries. So now what we've got left is uh, the right closed distal uh, femur fracture through the hardware um, and his uh, uh, associated both column acetabular fracture. <clears throat> so any, any thoughts? Uh, Dr. Burgess or, or a panel on how to take care of our femur fracture? Uh, no, I'm renail and then whatever adventure you like in getting out. Yeah. Thing, but th everybody's got tricks, and um, I, I think Ted, uh, Ted's here, and, and, and those of us who trained a while, but we had a lot more broken nails back in the day, so everyone's got in their memory <coughs> bank one method, then two, then a few from hooks to coming in behind but non-articular arrival of stuff of poking it out and, and it if you've done a few and have a couple of things at your disposal there's usually a trick you can use to get these out and um, this was closed uh, Timmy yeah. was open this was <coughs> yep. uh, my tolerance for getting in there is, is pretty low and, and if I had to go quickly to open it if some of my trickier things weren't working I'd be quick to open it because I don't think opening it and gaining some kind of control is a big deal mm -hmm. I completely agree. I mean, you can put wire, guide wires down, one of the, which is as a ball, and then try to back slap that way. Dr. Burgess alluded to trying to tap it out either through one of the interlocks. I, I guess conceivably you could go through the knee, although that wouldn't be optimal. You can reduce it, take out the proximal segment, and then there are actually attachments, um, that you can, uh, instruments that can go over the top and grab it. So that's, uh, can be hard as well. There's lots of different ways, but if this guy is still not super well, you want to have, you know, plans A, B, and C ready to go and know what nail that is so that you're not fiddling around with the extract all set. You want to be as expedient as you can be getting this done. And I agree, gun stock and fracture may be one of the necessary uh, things to um, move along. Yeah, I just had a question. What about treating it almost like a periprosthetic fracture with like an MCB plate that has sort of offset screw options that you can shoot around the, the nail and just treat it like you would a periprosthetic, just like a distal femoral locking plate and then shoot screws around the nail proximally is an option too. Yeah, and, uh, I think that's a great, I, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great option. Uh, we've certainly yeah, got experience <coughs> with treating around. Yeah. Something, something medullary, relatively simple fracture pattern, okay. predictable, and just leave the broken heart or anything from. The only thing is, we get enough compression because it's right. truly reduced. But I think it would, I think it would work. So he's taken on hospital day ten for removal of his nail and then uh, fixation of his <coughs> associated both uh, column. Well, Dr. Hanley tricks where he uh, passed a guide wire and then a ball tip and then used that to extract it after he reduced it and then uh, put in a new nail. And just some uh, images of the uh, fixation of the acetabulum. So just to round him out, on hospital day uh, 12, uh, he initially went back to the ICU after his big operations with ortho and was transferred back to the floor and then transferred to a, sk a skilled nursing facility to continue uh, rehab. And his three-month follow-up images are here. Had good uh, healing, um, but continued to have persistent weakness in his right upper extremity and right lower extremity. <clears throat> Was there, was there enough uh, diagnostic uh, uh, info now to, uh, with the combined weakness in right upper and right lower to sort of pinpoint where his neurologic problem was? How much was assigned to the sacral injury? How much was assigned to his CNS component from his strokes? Mm -hmm. I hadn't seen the... Uh, I'm, I'm he, just curious because you got right upper and right lower and <coughs> you don't want to over chase and blame, either blame yourself or say there's nothing we could do because it was this 
thing through the plexus or, or the, you know, the roots coming out of the sacrum where, it, where in fact it was all north of that. I, I mean, I don't know yet. So I, I do want to say another thing. It's just a comment that you didn't ask for, but you're going to get. And it's obvious yesterday uh, that and, and Houston is a good shop. We have Mark Persarn, who's dual fellowship trained. Your access to the skill sets of Carl and, and uh, Bella Barbara and something like that is don't ever take that for granted. I don't know if you noticed, but that didn't come up in my plan because I consider that when we fail, I go there. It has moved forward in you because it is one of those things that is, remember I talked about something that's relatively risk-free? This stuff is not a, an easy pass in the rest of the world. You bring in a couple of experts, they don't always coordinate that well and stuff. This was an answer for this problem. And I wasn't going to mention it because I wouldn't go there at first. And then my pass would wipe out. You went there earlier in your decision tree because you had access to that guy and you threw one by me. And I'm really ticked. You made me look foolish. But that's probably the payback for the Baltimore boy comment. But in, in <laughs> fact, the, the real comment here is you take that talent for granted, but don't. And when you get, I, I keep going to where your future is going to be. Don't take for granted you're going to call. Uh, hello, information. I'm at Acme General here in Kansas City. Could we get the spinal pelvic guy down here in a minute, please? <laughs> That's not going to happen. So this, this moved earlier on your list, and uh, it's, it's an impressive fix. I'm just saying that it's just another case for you. It's not for me. This is an impressive thing. Yeah, for, for sure that can be understated, and, and they are always available. We have two you know, full-time orthopedic spine guys that are always available to help us augment our fixation or substitute for our fixation in a place where we get crazy injuries. Thanks for having me, Dr. Bruce. Thank you for being here. Uh, yesterday we talked about the happy ending of a definitive treatment with a uh, external fixator. This is a case of less than a happy outcome. This is a guy who was down in Ecuador visiting his uh, family, uh, El Salvador, excuse me, and uh, a tree fell on him after he cut it down. Um, reciprocity. You'll get to know what that is, Chris. Uh, so the, he sustained an open tib fib fracture, and as it is in El Salvador, he had to save up the money, so it took him four days to find dollars to go to the operating room to get washed out and this external fixator placed. Uh, he was down there for about a month receiving antibiotics, ultimately required a skin graft to cover the wound. Um, he then presented to us eight months later. He has psoriasis and no other real uh, medical issues. Uh, he, the wound was closed and dry. It had been draining for several months, but it had been dry for about two months when it presented to us with this adherent, uh, very thin skin on bone uh, over the anterior aspect of his tibia. And uh, you may be surprised based on these x-rays that uh, he was neurovascularly intact. Um, so at this point, what are you thinking uh, with our, as far as options, given that this patient is adamantly opposed to amputation? Open that to the panel. Why, why would he, why was an amputation that was part, part of your potential treatments? Again? What, what was he missing? I missed the point of what it was defects that What's that? Oh, just the anticipation of, kind of given his original injury, appearance of his skin, that the, the bone defect, the anticipated bone defect after excision of the osteomyelitic gotcha. segment. We had a couple cases on, these are a couple bone loss cases. So we feel like the bone loss freight train is coming and it's going to be large. <laughs> So the next case is traumatic bone loss. This is tumor excision bone loss, effectively. I'm assuming there's other people. Have, I'm for my bone loss guys, and I'm just proceeding down that path. And I'm, I always have access to an Elizarovian type thought process as a partner, not my own. But uh, so uh, I'm headed down that and making sure he understands what that investment is in time. Uh, and it sounds, if you develop enough passion for not having the amputation, uh, hopefully you can be convinced that the other side of that equation is worth giving it a try. And, and, and realistically assess the risk of failure, success, et cetera. And, and as you guys all know, a, a well-trained Elizaroff, a lot of us got ticked, just so you know, 
uh, the guys that brought this to the United States, a, a, um, an uncomfortably large percentage of them tried to make the Elizarov the cure for everything and claimed few infections. So us old timers got a little angry against it. You know, you, you, I think we overreacted because in there is a good tool. The question is, is this a case that's a good case for it? And it may, it may turn out to be one. But so I'm, I'm for resection and moving stuff around if it tolerates it. Perfect. So uh, we got our basic workup to find out what the infection looks like. We got plastics to help us out in dermatology. Uh, and then in order to plan our resection, we got an MRI to see how extensive the infection was. In order to do that, we took the external fixer off. And so did, did I just interrupt you? Maybe are there any of the residents could just comment on what, what is the, because this is controversial, what is the utility of the, of the, MR, of the MRI for a, for a case like this? The patient's about eight months out. Uh, I think that's a good a good summary. So there's a lot of important points in there. One, looking at if it does demarcate to at least anticipate where where the osteomyelitic bone extends to, also looking for medullary involvement because what how might that drive you? If let's say it, it is traveling up the medullary canal. We can't do a total tibiectomy, if that's a word. But then you may have to have to the to it. Yeah, the ultimate tibiectomy. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Then you may have to ream the medullary canal to completely take away his infection or give him the best chance of ridding himself of the infection. It's never been it's never been proven, but that certainly makes logical sense if they if it does travel far, yeah. Was this your case as an attending? Mm -hmm. So as you're pulling the pins... You're not going to tell me to put on my big boy pants, are you? <laughs> <laughs> in this case, in this case it's, Bob, it's Bob's case. <laughs> they, they, they're too sensitive here, Dr. They are. That's another thing about the East Coast. You know, What are you doing, writing a book? Well, yes, I am. We'll leave that chapter out. So, so basically, you're removing hardware here, and the pins are sticking out. Do you, I'm saying you're about to take them out, do you check each one to see which is tight and loose, and then you screw them out. What was your protocol for the pin tracks? You're about, did you do the bone resection the same day you took the X-Fix off? Yeah. Did you have a protocol for each hole you encountered, and was it the same whether the pin was loose and sloppy or had good fixation when you took it out? Did you, what would you do after that? Curette, drill bit, what was, what was your whole protocol for the, Remaining X fix. Yeah, so the tight ones drilled, and for loose ones we curetted uh, just to expand it. But as you'll see, we also reamed the reamed the canal so that we would have egress uh, through it as much as possible and irrigated irrigated extensively. Did Even you, though there wasn't medullary involvement, but just in order to really sterilize the entire canal and the pin tracks. So you were you were aggressive enough to irrigate it, but you weren't aggressive enough to use a rhea. Well, we did later. Spoiler alert. Gotcha. Well, and if, uh, just so, uh, so when you reamed it, did the detritus come out the pinholes, or uh, did you make a separate hole at the distal end so that there's, you know, as you push it out, is it coming out the bottom? Yeah. So we we gave away the posterior hole except for except for drilling. Uh, yeah. Certainly didn't do any posterior exposure or any other way to try and to to try and address that. So after we got a sense of what happened in the MRI, we did our tubal bone excision uh, and reamed for a uh, inter uh, antibiotic nail, uh, fixed the fibula, got plastics and uh, surgery involved. They came the next day to place a flap given the tenuous soft tissue coverage, uh, got infectious disease involved to manage the multi-drug resistant Klebsiella and staph and enterococcus. Yep, lovely. <laughs> Um, and Ted, maybe you can comment to you in the Swinkowski days for, for kind of assessment of live versus dead bone. You know, Mark had his laser Doppler that he ran with for the residents. You know, Mark was here for a lot of years until, until 97, and it's hard to judge when and he was, he really had a special interest in osteomyelitis. Um, and he would go around for the laser Doppler. Uh, I think Ted, Ted can probably look at bone, say that's live, that's dead. 
Uh, any special tricks for identifying a junction between live bone and dead bone? No, I don't remember any, any special thing. I was, I didn't get too big into the laser doppler, but if we use it around because Mark was very interested in it. Um, I think infection is a little overrated. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that's a, that's a good point. You can heal the face of osteomyelitis, for sure. Did you, uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to ask some simple <laughs> questions. When you're depending on a fibula a lot for this excursion, you're, you need to strength for a while because you're going to be doing stuff over on the tibial side and it may not have a, a, uh, a definitive fixator for a while, definitive way of fixing things. Do you upgrade the plate? You plated the fibula there. Is it a regular uh, one-third tubular? Yeah, it's actually a 27 DC plate, so we did upgrade it. And because we were expecting, as we tried to distract it and get length, you see that extra screw, and we had used that as a push screw <laughs> instead of leaving it with a bicortical hole. I have no evidence, but we went ahead and filled it uh, so that we, he wouldn't break through his fibula. But, you sure, you sure you just didn't forget to take it out? Yeah, but you did notice it. it, it I have forgotten that one before, but uh, you can see that one is actually tightened down to, to both, so it was intentional. Sure, Sean. And all the cattiness has moved to the front row. Thank you. We're, we're, we're having the menagerie up here. But uh, my point is, a lot of us would think it'd step up, not, not just for the distraction part of it, but we're going to depend on this more than we ordinarily would. To, and we'd rather make render this a non-issue. So wh however you choose to step up, you, you don't just come from fixing a, a, you know, an ankle type plate, in my opinion. So for added stability, you got that medial uh, fixator place you can see there. Uh, he was followed up in clinic to plan for a custom nail. Um, his antibiotics were held prior to taking him back to the operating room about three months later. And um, he was then brought in after uh, three months of antibiotic treatment for rea debridement of the bone. A new uh, antibiotic nail was placed. We then admitted him to the hospital to ensure that the infection had cleared before we proceeded to our next uh, operative adventure, which was uh, to place our new custom nail. Um, did an osteotomy to, uh, with a jig a giggly saw to allow for a bone transport and place that a uh, ringed external fixer. Gave a 10 day latency period and then started um, transport. Uh, here you can see that transport beginning with one month uh, follow up and you can, if I can draw your attention right here to where our uh, regenerate is starting to form. Here you can see us transporting a little bit further and you can see that haze of the regenerate forming there. At three months and then at four months, uh, we're starting to dock it down here. It's a little hard to see, uh, but uh, at that point, the, he was taken back to the operating room and uh, the interlocks were placed in the transport segment and the ringed external fixture, fixator was removed. Um, of course, he went on to, uh, had a non-union at that docking site, but that was easily treated with uh, bone grafting after we got his psoriasis to close it, uh, or, um, addressed with that nail. Number one, it's, uh, can be technically challenging to get that transport to perfectly line up and dock on the distal aspect. Um, and with that nail, it provides a guide so you can transport that down with that variable cared for. Uh, another issue with, um, so that was why a nail, in part why a nail was chosen also, we could get the ring fixator off sooner with that nail in place. The other nuance with uh, bone transport is that after you take your transport fixator off, uh, that transport segment can recoil somewhat and so in order to keep that from happening that uh, custom nail was designed with that interlock in place to help prevent that recoil of the transport uh, segment. Um, the finer points of the US system for what it is that if you just drill a hole in the nail you're now liable as the surgeon as opposed to the implant company. So that's why we took the time to make, have a custom nail created. I bet the company still won't back you up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a su it's a supreme waste of money. I mean, a Midas, a Midas Rex in a single bit to create a hole of the appropriate size uh, versus, and I actually discussed it with 
that head of our OR at the time. He's, he's not there now, but um, they actually kind of admonished us and uh, with the cost to pay a company to put a hole in a nail where you direct them is in the neighborhood of about $3,000. Wow. Yeah. Well, of course, it's not billed as we're going to charge you $3,000 to put a nail in, or to put a hole in a nail, but the cost of a custom nail with a hole in is $3,000 more because it's a custom nail. It's like we type, it's, uh, it's ludicrous. You no, know, the, the femur is, of course, very different, but we, we used to have the guys that worked at night in the shop that we were, we were delighted to help us before we had custom nails. We even had locking nails with uh, screw holes in them. We would, uh, James and I would do these nailings that needed to lock nails, and we'd just call for the guy over at the shop, and he'd run over, he was actually we'd be delighted to put a hole or two or three in the nails wherever we wanted them. And he thought it was the best day he'd had that week because he was helping treat patients. Yep. For nothing. They would suit up and come running in. They loved it. <coughs> Matt was coming over from the machine shop. He was great, but yeah, we got rid of him. <laughs> too enthusiastic. Too much of a team player. <laughs> yeah. They got to go. The other thing is, the femur is very different. And I've nailed a number of femurs who had infected non-humans just nail them. And they stay infected, but they heal solid. Then you take the hardware out and you renew them a little bit, and it's over. Much less cost than this. But I don't know if you can do it in the tibia. I don't remember ever doing it. Kind of a win <laughs> okay. so, uh, I was just curious, speaking of um, expensive implants, um, has any kind of case been used that looks like that? Where sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, he went, the, he went the wrong direction for a while. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was, <laughs> yes. Kenny, what's the difference between this case and a tumor case? That's a huge, the history, obvious the reason why you wouldn't put a giant metal burden. In. Sure, there there is a history of infection, which I mean, we did in this case put in a large metal rod, and tumor that cases get infected that all you the can time. Take out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What do you do with it if that is seal prosthesis is infected? You suppress it and hope it's loose. That sounds like. Just a, I just it is room. I just thought I would ask. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> really don't hurt. Don't hurt. Yeah. 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 Short amount about 20 percent of the length of the limb before they get a venous congestion, and then the other option, I guess, would be again. I, I think if it were smaller, I don't. I can't give you the exact number, and it probably is based on the individual and their protoplasm and their uh, infection. Uh, you know what the virulence of the organism is. You can conceivably do a vasculite, and then just for uh, if nothing other. Uh, uh, Historical fibula in the face of infection. It's like Hansen said, Dr. Hansen said, you certainly get these things in the face of infection. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, as Cliff said, I'm going to present another case of significant bone loss managed via a different technique. So our patient is a 32 year old female who was on a sailboat. A motorboat crashed into her. There was a death on the scene. Uh, she sustained a right type 3B open tip fib fracture. She also had a left traumatic knee arthrotomy. Uh, her past history is significant for her tox screen being positive for meth as well as THC. However, she is not a smoker or otherwise healthy. Um, she does have a job. She, uh, <laughs> she was intubated uh, at the scene. These are her initial uh, films as well as an uh, injury picture. So as you can see, there's a uh, large soft tissue defect. There's a significantly comminuted segmental tibia fracture uh, with what appears to be quite a bit of devitalized bone. 
With regards to her physical exam, she does not have a dorsalis pedis pulse, but she does have a posterior tip pulse. Uh, her foot is warm, and she, when you lighten her sedation, she endorses having to plantar sensation and also appears to be flexing and uh, plantar flexing her foot. So for the panel and Dr. Burgess, what do you, factors do you think are important when considering limb salvage versus uh, amputation in a patient like this? And let's say this patient um, is older or a polytrauma patient or this defect is more distal or plantar sensation is not intact, how would your opinion change? Uh, if, you're, if you're asking me, uh, one of the things, whether I admit it or not, is uh, I often get driven to salvage when the patient's conscious enough to say, no matter what you do, I don't want to be amputated. So, so that actually is, it is, a, is freeing to the surgeon because you can make some fairly radical decisions. You can shift it and take it off against their wishes if you think it's going to threaten their life. But most of the time, it gives you justification to push ahead. But this, her proximal short, fragment a little short, is, um, looks pretty much intact. We remember we had one yesterday where this mush went up into the early articular area and it made the decision making a little easier. So you're describing something that you might have a, a, a more defined base of destroyed tissue and, and might be worth the salvage attempt, even separate from her wishes. And uh, so, uh, by the way, one of the leap, uh, you remember we milked the hell out of leap. I mean, we were all guilty of that, West Coast, East Coast. We can get another 27 publications, that's great. But one of the things that came out of that was the plantar sensation. Uh, a lot of us used to have that in our extremity salvage thing. If they were insensate on the plantar surface, take it. Turned out that's not so true if that's the physical exam. If you see the nerve, it's not in continuity. That's lack of sensation. But any physical exam, the vast majority of them that went ahead and salvaged the plantar sensation returned. So just that was one of the leap findings that we then threw away lack of plantar sensation as a one hard stop indication for, for stuff. So anyway, so I'm just putting that in there is that that was a lesson that where we changed our minds on that. So uh, she's going to be a player. The question to me is how early on do you start surrounding this with the fixation device that will also become her transport vehicle? Do you stage it? In my mind, because uh, my transport guys are not in the same building uh, a lot of times at night. Uh, I'm going to put on a, uh, my version of a simple fixer to manage this, and I will take into account potentially screwing up the path of those that follow me. I'll try to be as kind as possible and, and not ruin things to come. And then debris the hell out of it and put a senior person on the, ass on the assignment for the viabilities of large fragments. Those most likely have to go, but this is all of our hypocrisy. We talk a good game, and then I go, I alluded to this yesterday, then I go out in the hallway and take a phone call. And somebody less experienced than me is making the decision on that. And I think this, most of us, what we're saying, we want senior hands in here. This looks like a slam dunk that this has to go, but I'm not sure of that. And, and if it does, that presents another problem, because you're probably going to have to transport in reverse, right? Which is less common than the other way around. and. Uh, you usually you want to make your cut through the metaphysis, right? So now you're in the distal tibia where it may not be as well vascularized. So I think uh, that's where the rubber hits the road is finding out whether those two major pieces are salvageable or not. Yeah, and there may be subsections of them that are. We've done all done some strange things where there were parts of it that on the edge that just didn't have any punctate bleeding and you ronjured into it and you had to make that decision even should you take a third or a half of it away and still have a slip that throughout its entirety, although just a slip, was vascularized and worth keeping. Dr. Burgess, are there any other uh, patient-specific factors that would make you lean more towards amputation versus limb salvage? Let's say if they're the, older the, or medical problems. Uh, at the standard, uh, I'm trying to think of anything. I mean, mm -hmm. diabetes, heavy okay. smoking history, age, signs of atherosclerosis in the calcium profile, you know, in, the, in physically the calcium profile of her vessels, um, and compliance, obviously. Uh, there's some uh, toxicology that would suggest that may be an issue. And, and one of the ones with staging this with an X-Fix, that also, one other thing it does besides, I'm saying we jump early to the, 
to the definitive fixation, but staging with a, a simpler X fix while you're getting ready also applies some thought process in here to investigating her uh, her thoughts and attitudes about going through this. Because if you're going down the road to transport, we're talking about many months with this, and that's not for every patient. There may not be the emotional or psychological uh, reserve to, to tolerate that, uh, or even on the physician side either. Uh, Rat did a lot of these, and then when the patients started calling him at home, um, I think that's when he started to lose his enthusiasm. Okay, so uh, she went under underwent multiple debridements over the next 10 days. Uh, she went to the hospital, or she went to the OR uh, pretty much initially upon presentation to the hospital. Uh, most of those fragments were devitalized. She underwent an extensive debridement. Her tuber, there was a fracture of her tubercle that was fixed on uh, the first day, which was placed into an X-fix. Uh, subsequently, she underwent fixation of her fibula as well as her proximal tip fib joint. So in summary, at this point, we have a 32-year-old, otherwise healthy female, questionable uh, social history as far as her drug use, with a now 18-centimeter bone defect. She has, um, has some soft tissue loss, but it's pretty much just her anterior compartment. The rest of her compartments are actually pretty good. Um, she has a fractured tubercle, but it's now fixed, and uh, her tibial nerve is functioning. So um, at this point, oh, sorry, one other key point. So she was extubated, and she was adamant that she did not want an amputation. So at this point, what are your options for? Did you share this film with her? Uh, I believe they did. I'm, I'm curious. I, I don't know. I mean, I a lot of times yeah. we get through this in my shop, and I'm, I'm surprised and embarrassed by the fact is why we're trying to educate our patients. We're several days into it, and a bunch of us are going, crap. The, the most visual thing yeah. we can show them, besides an, if they are awake for a wound change, but the other most physical thing is, is the, you know, these x-rays. We surprisingly don't do that enough. Yeah. Uh, this is her soft tissue defect. So at this point, for all of you, what are your options and thoughts about management of this bone defect? Well, she certainly needs soft, soft tissue coverage mm -hmm. simultaneous with some way to replace that bone, whether it's with metallic replacement, Kenny said, allograft replacement, not good, transport, or massive bone grafting. You, can't, you don't even have the option to do posterolateral bone grafting because it's so proximal, so it'd have to be, uh, have to be some type of uh, masculine technique or similar type of massive bone grafting with coverage timing to be discussed. Or what about a contralateral free fibula? Yeah, mm -hmm. or the free fibula. Yep. So you sure could do contralateral free fibula. You know, we've got a case pending, and Jeff Friedrich keeps bugging me because I think he wants to yeah. do a free fibula. He keeps saying we're not going to do the free fibula, but uh, you know, so we do have certainly have the have the technology. Um, if you have it, contralateral free fibula, obviously because. This one is fractured. People have even done hemi section fibula with transport into the defect to just create a sheet of bone uh, into it. Um, it's too long for a double barrel. Um, it sure would be great, you know, if you have a smaller defect and you can do a double barrel free fibula. Um, that's much more predictable in terms of getting fibular hypertrophy, but uh, a single peg and then wait for that hypertrophy. And you have enough over the years, uh, what your experience has been with awaiting the, the free fibula hypertrophy. Um, Very small, and to show you how far back that goes, we didn't have, we didn't feel we had the skill sets even with some very good place, but we borrowed Andy Wyland a lot when he, would, when he lived in Baltimore, and he did our free fibulas for us. And so a small number, successful, and not too much hypertrophy. Uh, the, the fibula healed, in place and it did not hypertrophy as much as we don't. But the technique and the ability to do it was pretty good. Uh, we sort of abandoned it uh, because we couldn't get it. We couldn't get the hypertrophy part. So this is a this is a one vessel leg, right? This is a one vessel leg. Mm -hmm. She said the DP. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. You better. Yeah, okay. better cross ones for sure. Mari, your experience you've had <laughs> with uh, free fibula because I know that you guys go to the fibula more frequently because of the, the skill set 
that, that you have. Pretty good luck. Yeah, very good. It would have been put that TSF frame, like that for good. They did that a lot. Are you feeling they were, I've heard you feel, like, I know it's, I put you on the spot. Probably didn't feel like you saw tens, yeah. tens of millions of them, but that kind of length of time that they would be in the frame waiting for the free fibula to hypertrophy adequately for frame removal. Up to a year. There were several of them that were walking around frames for a year. Uh, but they did well. They did very well. Yeah, I think that's always the, the issue with free fibulas is and how long can you leave someone in a frame. But you also find that on massive bone grafting, those patients are not only appearing for a very long period of time for that bone to incorporate. You know, transport without a nail, you know, this, I'm sorry, it's how many centimeters? 18. 18, so, you know, that would be a year and a half in a frame, no nail, six months in a frame with nail. None of them, none of them are that easy. Okay, so um, she underwent um, another irrigation debridement and then this is a Dr. Bray's case. He decided to do induced membrane technique for stage bone grafting. Uh, she underwent fixation of, she had a little plateau component um, and then had a 18 centimeter cement spacer placed the following day. Uh, I actually think it may have been. Uh, she did well. Um, however, towards discharge, she started to develop a little bit of necrotic tissue at the end of her flap and um, uh, was discharged on antibiotics. This is at the time of her cement spacer. We'll see if this actually works, which may be a little miracle. So she had a great motion. Sorry, go back. That's the most beautiful cement spacer ever, other than tongue, tongue, tongue depressors. You must have done it in a, a tube and got the tube off or big tubey surgery. Do I don't remember, yeah. That, just let it, I, yeah. I don't know if functionally it's any different, but God knows it looks pretty. <laughs> that's, that's tube made, I mean, that's tube made. <laughs> no concerns. portion of her flap, she underwent another debridement uh, with the uh, plastics hand team and uh, underwent a round of wound vax, um, she in, as well as a skin graft. Ultimately, Dr. Bray took her back to the OR four months later for a spacer exchange because she was infected. Um, so at this point, what, what do you do now that she does have an ongoing infection? You're now four months out from placement of your initial spacer. Any other thoughts? No? Continue on. Yeah. Okay. It was noted at the time of her spacer exchange that she had a really robust membrane. So. Um, Yeah. So that when you get to these decision points six months, a year later, you've already talked about what you might do if you got that far along and things weren't going well. You don't have to have such a big decision to say, well, you know, we didn't tell you, but this this could happen. Because I found that the, the best thing is to really lay it out and say, look, I'll try this salvage, but if we get to a point that it takes this period of time or we're having this kind of trouble, or something, then you have to agree that we'll go to an amputation. So, um, so Ted, to answer that, we have, we, we quote this guy, named Cottle and Stern, followed by an editorial by this guy named Hansen. And we start out by stating that we've got decisions to make. And if we haven't succeeded in supplying you with a limb that is viable in a year and a half, then your best viability is amputation. But the decisions are made at nine months and a year, and if you are making progress towards successful bone healing, then we will stick with this for another six months. It's obvious that we're no better off now, a year later than we were beginning this time to talk to Doug Smith about amputation. 
And I think that's, unless I'm mistaken, that has been the common thread of all of the traumatologists here is to quote you and use you as, as the basis for where we set up timelines for these people. I think it's really important, it's a really important message that we, that we don't state over and over again, but it's a common message that I, I've never heard any patient that hasn't heard this from one of the, the trauma attendants here. I, I just want to clarify take a pediatric perspective. The question that's asked right at the beginning in children like this, is, in children who have congenital anomalies, is uh, can I make something better or buy something better? Because sometimes there's just not enough pieces there to make a limb that's going to work as much as the parents want. And that what you can purchase from the prosthetic is going to last child function better. But that's theoretical to the parent. And the longer we keep working on something, the more we get married to it. And the patient as well. And the patient as well. So the question that we've thought about is, how is the parent and the child, if they're old enough, educated about this? What do we do actively other than say, in 18 months, so we start at the beginning, even before the first reconstruction, in a, having a program that has the child and parent work with limb deficient children that have prostheses. So they follow them along during that period of time and see how their child is lagging and how those with prosthesis are playing in school and skiing and doing all the other things. And I, what I hear absent here is the active education to a patient that you know has a risk of amputation. What active education is there that's going on with seeing people with amputations discussing and doing that outside of our it's a great surgical question. world? But it's a, John's got a pretty good answer. Yeah, well, right. it's, it's, I mean, this is what I think Doug Smith has really championed over the past with the whole limb viability service and support ne network with previous traumatic amputees that he hooks these folks up with so they can have these conversations so that they really know what the other side looks like as they're undergoing a limb, a limb salvage. So yeah. I, maybe I misunderstood because I thought I heard you say, Doug, that at the end when it's time for failure, then. We send out. It starts at oh, the we, very beginning with the conversation because Doug Smith and myself and the trauma team, and it's kind of like Doug comes in and from the very beginning. On this, I can guarantee you that the very beginning. Yeah, beginning this was right. initially Dr. Smith's patient yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. Which was very interesting because right. of how this looked. These patients also go to the education support group at Harborview very early in their course when they go through these. And a lot of times the patients are sort of scared to tell you they want to make. For me with these patients, I actually bring it up very frequently when they're going down a bad road, seemingly, like, hey, it's not, you know, it's not my legs and it's not my life and I want you to do the right thing. So don't be scared to speak up and say, hey, you know, I think we should call this now. So I think that's another thing that really needs to be brought up to these patients is that it's their decision and they're not disappointing me if they decide that at some point they've had enough with this. So we bring this up from the very beginning with all these that's yeah, at the risk sounding like I'm constantly trying to brown nose you for inviting me here, the rest of us in the country use how it happens on this site as uh, your criticisms are, are understood. I'm just letting you know the rest of us in the trauma business in the United States use how it works in Seattle as the blueprint on how to do it for the reasons you guys just covered. We're all deficient in it, but if there's one place and it's got some, it's got a, a few fathers and, and, and directors of it, but it's carried through the faculty here. This is the way you do it. This, the patient was probably as well educated as any place. So, you know, we're all trying to catch up to it and make little inroads, and then we lose a critical faculty member, or we get lazy or sloppy. It's it's in the it's in the DNA of this place. I keep using that term, but I think the way we approach that. And, and once again, for the young folks that are going elsewhere, don't take that for granted. Carry that legacy with you when you go to your next post. You know. Thanks. Uh, I would uh, also say that 
the, the education, the ongoing education is important because the perception of life with an amputation can be incorrect in either direction. Uh, some people are, for whatever reason, are adamantly opposed uh, for fear that they're never going to be able to do anything. And there are others who see uh, these high-level athletes um, who are using, uh, you know, extremely sophisticated uh, prosthetics and they believe that they're going to be able to do that as well. Whereas for some of these patients, the truth lay somewhere in the middle. Uh, so uh, you have to be, they, they need to, a, a dose of getting an idea of what their life, not, you know, what Oscar Pistorius's life or was until a year ago, I guess. Um, um, uh, it's going to be like Great. Uh, so she actually did well. She cleared her infection and five months after her initial injury underwent a bone grafting. Uh, a, a autograft was obtained from the ipsilateral femur via the RIA technique. It was mixed with about 120 cc's of allograft and uh, he ended up putting on a medial plate as well because he was concerned about her falling into varus. These are her immediate post-operative films. And then uh, here is her <coughs> at 11 months. And then at 18 months, she you can, approximately there was a screw that backed out. So she under, that was removed and uh, she had two more screws placed. So at this point, um, she was working in sales. She was actually doing yoga um, and uh, was using a cane intermittently, but overall was, was pretty happy. She did return about five years later um, with some proximal tibial pain. A CT was obtained which demonstrated incorporation of the graft and, and, um, and uh, healing of, of the bone. Um, and however, she left to California and we don't know what happened to her. That's it. Yeah. Did they nail the femur from the rhea? They did and that was, there was a, the medial cortex was pretty thin after the rhea. So they prophylactically nailed it. Where do you enter when you do an integrated harvest? Sure. So the, the, the one quick fracture I had, mm -hmm. uh, I, I turned around to answer the phone literally, and my, my fellow had used, he was used to accessing the proximal femur with the big fixed reamer and, and nails of that sort for intertropes and subtropes, and, which I don't do, but I mean, uh, I make very slow, repeated, small things to make sure it's only the reamer path that will engage. Do you know what I mean? Not not send it a stiff reamer that's kind of, and that was the one that fractured within days while the guy was in bed. So do you nail all your um, harvested ones? Well, it's definitely the exception. I think we've learned a lot because I had a I had a fracture rolling over in bed in a patient. Uh, that's on that's on me, not on her, uh, and definitely related to the size. So once we size up the, the minimum outer diameter of the femur, I think in this case, because I think I remember talking about it with Dave, felt like in order to get adequate bone, he was going to go past, you know, if you want to use 0.45 times the minimum outer diameter, that'll decrease the torsional stability of the bone, then to discuss with the patient about prophylactic nailing. So it's, I'd say it's the exception. I think maybe it's been done a couple of times. Yeah. And on that same vein, uh, there's been a couple of times either for debridement or to get graft. Um, there's been uh, the debridement done on the tibia, okay? And because you come in anteriorly, it's not concentric down with a stiffer, longer reamer than we typically have for our, with our regular reamers. It's very easy to ream out the posterior cortex. So, uh, you know, it's, just be very careful with a bigger reamer. Plus, it's going to be a smaller canal, and I'm not even sure how small the rhea um, ones go. It was 12, 12. 12. Yeah, so 12, so it's 12 and a team is gonna be pretty good size in a lot of people. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, good morning. <laughs> know who your friends are. <laughs> so moving on, we're gonna be talking about a case of a femoral shaft fracture as we cover a large geography, um, the mechanism of injuries from an avalanche. So we have a 43-year-old man, uh, very athletic, uh, who was skiing in Alaska, caught in an avalanche, tumbled about 1,600 feet, hit multiple trees, there were deaths at the scene. 
He was seen at an outside hospital in Alaska, found to be hypotensive, low crit. He was transfused five units of packed red blood cells, two units of FFP, and multiple liters of saline. He was found to have a tense thigh and a femoral shaft fracture on imaging. Uh, other images, uh, chest x-ray showed a hemonumothorax with approximately 25% involvement of the chest. Chest tube was placed there. Uh, he got most of his trauma workup at the, at the outside hospital. And, what's that? Is it your phone interrupting your period? That's probably mine. Pass your phone. Mine's very powerful. No, no, put it on your computer. I think he turned it off and it stopped. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, he was found to have uh, multiple rib fractures on his trauma workup, um, but no intra-abdominal injury and uh, no pelvic pathology. He had a CTA done at the outside hospital because of the type of femur fracture he had, which showed no vascular injury. He was cleared for transfer, transferred to Harborview via airlift. Uh, in flight, he got about one unit of packed red blood cells, and then uh, he was placed in a Thomas splint for transfer. 12 hours, sorry, 12 hours later, he arrived at Harborview. Uh, again, was hypotensive, tachycardic, had a high base deficit, got two more liters of crystalloid. His crit was okay, given what it was before at the other hospital, but he was found to be coagulopathic and uh, have an elevated CK. So, after the primary exam, secondary exam was done by the uh, orthopedic team. He had a swollen thigh, ecchymosis, diffuse tenderness to palpation all over the thigh. All compartments were firm. He had decreased sensation in the sural saphenous, deep perineal, and superficial perineal nerve distributions. Uh, traction was released, the, the Thomas splint, um, and he recovered some of his sensation. His motor function was overall grossly good, uh, but later um, in the course of the, uh, his, his stay in the ER, uh, lost motor function. Uh, vascular exam was intermittently palpable DP and PT with an ABI of greater than one, and uh, the palpable uh, exam was, was based on uh, his stock blood pressure. So why don't we have Dr. Domes uh, go over this x-ray? <laughs> so AP radiograph of a thigh skeletally mature uh, patient that has a comminuted uh, mid-shaft diaphyseal uh, femur fracture on the right with Butterfly fragment. Perfect. Uh, I didn't mention this. This uh, injury is closed, so that's that's important to note. So I, I've noted, that's a stitched uh, it is. image, and uh, the original actually reflects he had several centimeters of translation. That was like the way I do a you know you, you do your pre-op planning. You, you put the pieces back where they go, but that's not where they were. Yeah, this he was in the emergency. Yeah, this was in traction. Uh, he's in he's in Thomas traction right here. But, but oh. that that I'm saying I would mention that in the, if you're describing it for and you did you did describe it well, but and uh, that might be a not a way to end the sentence and I it looks like he might be in traction and have that question answered by the time you finished your description because when you talk now with the pressure issues been raised and a couple other things that's going to figure into where you might go from here or, or alter some circumstance to continue your kind of workup of, that, of what's going on. So after he lost motor function, the Thomas uh, splint was immediately removed uh, and he was replaced into distal femoral traction. Uh, these were his diagnoses. So he has a right closed comminute femoral shaft fracture. Uh, concern for, oh yes, sorry. Dr. Burgess. Go back one? Yes. He's in traction. I would like to know, I honestly would like to know how many pounds is on him. That, there's a whole lot of information about to come here. If somebody says he's got 10 pounds on an adult male and he still comes apart that far. Yeah. I keep getting back to mechanism, but something happened. Either he wrapped around a tree with this and his body kept going and his legs stayed behind a little bit and then followed him with a millisecond later. You know, you remember we talked about ejection out of a vehicle? Well, a fixed point, I got into scapula thoracic years ago, but if you read the French articles, they talk about two-wheel vehicles with no antagonist. And when they're talking about it, are people coming off, catching a body part, and going away, and then it snaps back and catches you, and you're dealing with these 
things where it's left behind that part for a little while. Maybe so, in avalanche tumble, maybe not. So, so I, that makes perfect sense for this patient. He's actually a power lifter. He is, he's massively muscular. Um, I'm familiar with that. Um, and, <laughs> um, and that's, uh, we, I, I can't absolutely, I will, I will stipulate that he has 15 pounds of distal femoral traction. Okay, but you, you know where I was headed with that. Absolutely. So. All right. stick, that's sticking out to most of the gray hairs is, whoa. Pretty far. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. So these are his diagnoses. Closed common femoral shaft fracture. Concern for acute compartment syndrome of the thigh. He has blood loss, obviously, multiple rib fractures, hemonumothorax, and then this concern for a sciatic nerve palsy with loss of motor function. What are our ne next steps? Resuscitation, obviously, and then, uh, yes? So I'm, I'm a little concerned about the, the neurologic status, and you went from a Thomas splint with traction to skeletal traction with distraction, and if you have a side compartment at risk, why would you be in traction at all, right? So, I mean, this is a case where you would probably opt for shortening, and even though it might be uncomfortable, you're certainly going to decrease this compartment pressure. So, no question. Um, sort of it, it, inconsistent. That's a good point. Uh, so, next steps. Um, he was found to be uh, GCS score 15. He's in. He's cleared for the OR, um, and we take him to the OR. So he goes and gets a fasciotomy of the thigh, anterior and posterior compartments, uh, irrigation debridement, uh, anti-grade. Uh, in really so yes, um, uh, according to the notes, uh, everything was, was very tense. The, the fascia opened up uh, very easily, and uh, they were able to isolate the sciatic nerve as well, found that it was in continuity. It was heavily contused, um, but uh, so everything was. That. So he got uh, a long lateral incision. Uh, we came through the other two. We ran the uh, quads of vastus lateralis, whatever, came, uh, ballooned out through immediately. This was clearly something that needed to be de decompressed. We came through the lateral intramuscular septum, and then there was. Uh, a lot of uh, hammered muscle, some obviously necrotic, some unclear at this point. I could, this is the unusual part for me is having done this, I could see his about 10 inches of his nerve, and it was looked stretched like taffy. It was massively contused, consistent with having fallen down and hit every branch uh, on the way down the hill. So I think an important point, if ever you're releasing thigh compartments, make sure that anesthesia is on board with what is about to transpire. They better, eat, you might even want to have blood hanging. Um, we actually did to my greatest, well, go ahead. But yeah. My greatest fear was that he had a femoral artery or femoral vein, uh, large, uh, you know, uh, vessel injury, and that he would decompress. So we did talk about that with anesthesia. Yeah. If he was transferred in, right, he's coming from Alaska, so there's some time left. On the, on the other side of this stuff, quick rescue, quick thigh compartment syndrome with intact pulses distally. Our, our rollback for that is profunda until then, because if they appear really quick and yet the pulse is okay down below, we make sure that uh, I think we over CTA people, but that's one play. He's not that. He's, this has occurred no, at a different his, time. His transfer from Alaska actually probably took four to five hours, uh, which is sort of, you know, that's he was in a trauma uh, splint that entire time there, and I think that contributed to his nerve Well, I, I'm suggesting I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't think he's that. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I was saying if you got him quicker and his compartment syndrome arrived early in the thigh, yeah. yet his pulses were intact. In our world now, it's become the profund until proven otherwise. Yep. That's the way that appears. It's a torn vessel, but bypassed by an intact one. Right. You know. And have, what's, what's your protocol for? Uh, to, 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 to manage that protocol is to study it, and then the management is a quick fasciotomy and maybe fasciotomy get the pack and an angio. Or? Yes, uh, we because that that pressurizes pretty quickly, and the thigh, as you know, we wrote a while ago, it's a bad thing. Thigh compartments indicate something bad's happening. That's uh, 
often prolonged entrapment and stuff like that, but this is a different. All right. So after his first intervention, he returned to the OR on post-op day two, four, and seven uh, for debridement, uh, removal of necrotic tissue. Uh, on day four, uh, he was actually, there were uh, vancomycin and tobramycin impregnated beads that were placed. Uh, he had delayed primary closure starting on day four and uh, was closed by day seven. Um, on day 14, he had recovered uh, and was discharged to a sniff. Beads still in place? Yes. Yes. So talking a little bit about this, um, not that we brought up beads, uh, what are the thoughts on uh, using beads with a closed injury like this? I'm a fan. I, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer. I think they substitute for good debridement and some other thing a number of times in, in other centers, and I, I, I think they can be misused. I did an inadequate debridement, but I put on a bead pouch. My infection rate's gone down. This is not that. But when I have, uh, so uh, then you get in, it, w does it have a real use here? In my opinion, it does. It's not going to hurt anything. I'm probably going to be there again. Um, and I'll, I'll answer my opinion on the others if people have a difference. But I'm a single incision and then, then reevaluate the adductors. And very often, most people in the room will tell you they don't need to be released if, if, the, if the first incision has gotten both in, you know, the quad and the posterior. But, Every once in a while, you need to do the adductors. It depends on the case. That was our sense, and that was how we proceeded with this case. In terms of the beads, you know, he, uh, he has a 30-centimeter incision. Uh, he's in the ICU for a week. Uh, I think at, at least one point, the back failed to seal, um, hold its seal, um, you know. So I, I thought that this was prophylaxis, uh, but uh, I thought it was reasonable to, to use this as hopefully an adjunct Okay, not a substitute for the treatment. All right. Moving on to follow-up, at two weeks, uh, he continued to have uh, no function of his uh, dorsiflexion. Uh, plantar flexion was intact, however. Uh, he still had absent sensation to the DPN and uh, superficial perineal nerve. Uh, full sensation in the tibial, sural, and saphenous distributions. Uh, he had a little bit of a contracture at week two, but good for his overall injury. At week six, uh, same uh, motor exam, he started recovering some of his superficial perineal nerve and increasing his range of motion. He returned to Alaska at 10 weeks post-op and had uh, further follow-up there uh, from 10 weeks to 11 months. We have the advantage of the light of Paul is in uh, Anchorage, so you know, he'd get x-rays and then we'd discuss the case so the patient wouldn't have to come back each, for each visit. So he returned uh, at 11 months uh, after his injury for his first follow-up. At that point, he'd returned to weightlifting. He still had some discomfort and had to take tramadol on the days when he was active. Uh, lab laboratory markers were checked. They were not elevated. Uh, he continued to have uh, decreased function of his nerve, and uh, range of motion had greatly improved. These are his x-rays. Uh, Beads are still in place, uh, but at 11 months, there was concern for non-union. At that time, we obtained a CT scan, uh, which confirmed the non-union. And at this, at this point, what are our next steps? Uh, I, I addressed the non-union. Yeah. So, I mean, I... Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. So I pay for the plane tickets. Yeah. Uh, genius is found. So, the, but 11 months to me, I, I've waited long enough, is what I'm saying. And then the plan is what and how and re injure and re nail, add bone, you know, all the standard list of questions on how you would pack that. And there's even some of us that might do something and just leave the beads there, for instance, and not disrupt, or that might find, that might be the, the act of getting them out might create the perfect pouch to install bone graft in. You know, it's it, its own little mini masculet in bead form. Uh, or you could you could obviate it and do some of the techniques where you might avoid direct, you know, some yeah. of us just might overream and re-nail or so that goes to the whole range. So he actually had, uh, I think you can go back up one, he had um, some heterotopic ossification um, distally that was bothering him uh, laterally. 
uh, and anteriorly, I don't know if it's well seen there, some of it is, I guess. Uh, so he, uh, that was uh, <coughs> hurting him, so I, rather than doing like a close re-nailing or something like that, uh, uh, we opted, to, we did this open, uh, we took out all the beads we could get out that weren't caught up in the callus that were sort of posterior medial. Uh, we took down a bunch of heterotopic ossification. We did uh, re-nail him and we used uh, posterior iliac crest bone graft. And I believe we used uh, BMP as well. Yeah, he, would, he did. So. What were the leg lengths like? The leg lengths? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're very similar. Okay. Tissues, cultures were also taken at this op operation. Uh, there was no growth for one month, but uh, a month later, there was one sample with uh, Propionum bacterium species that was isolated in broth. Uh, he was treated with amoxicillin and rifampin uh, back home in Alaska. In August in Alaska, these are some of his follow-up imaging. Uh, so d definite improve improvement uh, as far as... Uh, process to union, uh, and then he returned nine months after this, uh, his second operation, at which point in time he had returned to squatting, 175 pounds, uh, continues to work on uh, range of motion, and he's able to get at least 120 degrees. His pain's improving, uh, but given his last x-ray and having st still a little bit of pain, he was really requesting a CT scan. So these are the results of his CT scan, which show uh, some continued non-union. Uh, we can compare them to his previous uh, CT scan, which shows a uh, definite increase in bone mass. Um, and uh, this is him today. Sunday. Or Sunday. So he'd return to snowboarding. That's actually him going down the slopes. And uh, he's very happy. <laughs> so... Yeah. So there is some sense, he's obviously made uh, significant progress from his last procedure, which was March of 14, to December, which was where the second CT was. There's still, um, I, he had not bridged, it's been, I guess, nine months. Uh, there's a question as to what to do. So I, I, you know, I was not eager, based on his level of comfort and activity, he, the guy is, um, squatting like 175 or 180, six sets of 12 reps. I mean, um, so I felt that we're going to hold the course on him and uh, talk to four or five of my partners. They also agree. So. It's actually in Toronto. Yeah. It's actually, it's recovering. His excursion is not great, but it has uh, continued to improve over, over time. So. I mean, that's something you may not, you know, what I learned here is not to pull the trigger on that too fast, it actually did start to come back. <laughs> Thank you, pardon? Has he got cocked up toes? No. And so kind of uh, in conclusion, uh, moving forward, uh, what are our criteria that we would uh, consider reoperation on him? Given, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, or at least something in the hardware that suggested that that's being loaded. Uh, like, if the there's cavitation around the interlocking screws, or they bend, or anything, but he's got nothing. So I think, at the very least, he has major fragment to major fragment uh, load transmission, which is at least protecting his implant, uh, and probably more likely he is at least spot welded, and he has what's probably an implant dependent uh, union. Yeah. And I, I wasn't able to find any literature as far as uh, femoral fractures with uh, compartment syndrome and then union afterwards. Uh, does anyone have experience with that? Do, do they have a harder time to union, unite after uh, compartment syndrome like this? I, th I think that in his case, that maybe a mechanism that I suggested or something else with a severity gave you the compartment syndrome because muscle was damaged. Yeah. I think the major issue is that the history of that and the biomechanics of that, he has stripped periosteum as part of that soft tissue mess. And it's, it's the same risk factor, very similar as you would assign to a, 
a moderate sized wound, but where the, the femur had exited significant amount of distance and the patient had become real short on that leg and then sort of popped back. But it was obvious when you did your debridement that you, it kind of introduced it in the wound and everything fell away from it. I think that was the closed version of this and his mechanism gave him both enough muscle to give him the compartment problem and stripped his blood supply to the, that. in other words, they're related, but I wouldn't assign it to the compartments. You, you know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. maybe just verbiage, but. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Home stretch. <clears throat> so this patient is a 38-year-old man who was involved in a high-speed motor vehicle crash versus a tree at about 9 p.m. at night. He complained of immediate right hip pain upon the medic arrival to the scene and had pain with any movement of his hip. He was taken to an outside facility where he was found to have a posterior hip dislocation and a suprafoveal femoral head fracture. And he was transferred to Harborview and got there at 1.30 in the morning. He's a healthy guy. He's not polytraumatized, has a mild pulmonary contusion and was immediately cleared uh, in the ER by general surgery for any sort of intervention. Uh, he's a stay-at-home dad. He drinks three drinks per week, doesn't use any tobacco or drugs. His exam, uh, he was hemodynamically... I call BS on that because he's a, his, he's a beer brewer by trade. Yeah. <laughs> so my guess is he has more than three drinks yeah. per evening. <laughs> so he's hemodynamically stable. His hip is uh, flexed with uh, sort of a neutral to slight external rotation position. And he's neurologically normal with uh, good distal motor function and sensation uh, it was normal in all nerve distributions. So this was his initial AP pelvis uh, from his initial presentation. What you can see is he has a right-sided Pipkin II femoral head fracture dislocation. Uh, he has an incidental finding of a bone island in his femoral neck. This is uh, his axial T CT also done at the outside facility. And what you can see is the bone island present, the femoral head is reduced within the acetabulum, and the uh, intact femoral head neck uh, distal segment is impacted on the supraacetabular iliac bone. And in the coronal CT, you can see this again. Um, the, you can notice the femoral head is actually um, flipped 180 degrees within the acetabulum, but again, you can notice the impaction there of the uh, distal aspect of the femoral neck impacted on the um, supraacetabular iliac bone. So, uh, questions for the panel. Is this a hip dislocation in which you would perform a closed reduction attempt with sedation? If you were to do it, is this one you'd do in the ER or in an operating room? And is the timing of this patient's arrival a factor in your decision making? For example, this patient you know, he hits Harborview's ER about three to four hours after his dislocation event. Is that change if the patient hits the door immediately from, say, the field, or if they've been transferred from a further distance, like from Alaska, and they arrive with a dislocated hip eight to 12 hours after the initial injury? And then finally, this is a little bit of a leading question, but are there any unique features about this particular type of hip dislocation that give you pause? For example, the position of the leg uh, with a flexed posture and, and neutral to slight, extra, uh, slight external rotation. I'm conflicted, so yeah, I'm relatively conflicted, but and there are some features that you always get concerned about uh, with femoral head fractures, especially when the limb is slightly neutral and what appears to be almost a direct cranial dislocation. I think those are those kind of herald potential potential issues uh, that it's not going to come easily. The other thing I didn't specifically mention, but it's on the CT, is he has an intact posterior wall as well of the acetabulum. Which is really, I think, common on these side. I have intact or minimal, just small peripheral, extremely small peripheral uh, rim acetabular fractures at best with it. Uh, I'm, no, I'm just curious. Uh, they. Uh, and actually, either way doesn't matter to me, but it would be nice if the ED had that information on the cat, let's say, and made a decision, which might include not doing anything. I mean, that's, they're not, this isn't something they're going to see typically, and I would like to be party to that discussion prior to transfer, just because I'm not sure you can fault them one way or the other. The important thing is they saw it, they made a decision, oh, I'm not going to try anything in this particular case. And if you were one that thought it might benefit, 
you might ask them to give it a try. I'm not so sure many of us would, but um, I would like to see their ER thinking because I, I think it shows how generally how well educated our ER colleagues are. Pretty often they, they know more than we think and they might say, this is special, I'm not going to get into it. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I would that that were true. <laughs> okay, but you know, sometimes too much treatment, sometimes too little, and I'm not sure what the right answer is, by the way, in this particular one, but it'd be nice to see that they at least had a thought and acted based upon their evaluation of this cat, because you don't see this that often as an ER doc, I would imagine. Great. So the decision was... I think in general, the bigger the... This is the problem, because the, the major head fragments reversed. But uh, you know, the, the bigger the fragments, so Pipkin 2s are generally easier to reduce than Pipkin 1s because most of the head's left. Um, but uh, then you have then you, the question is, we'll get to that in a minute, but the wisdom of even making the attempt with, the, with that fragment in that position. So. Yeah, I mean, I think over the, over the years of reviewing these, I mean, uh, shockingly, sometimes, let's say it's not fixed with that same appearance, even with the head reversed, it, I find it to be pretty surprising that a percentage of these with traction, if they're going to reduce, uh, I don't know how the head piece flips around. It looks counterintuitive, but it obviously has some inferior soft tissue attachments. Um, and it will, it will wrestle out of the way sometimes. But I mean, I think we're going to get to some of the key aspects of this, which is how much force do you put on it? How vigorous of an attempt do you keep calling bigger, bigger and more people? Probably not. Uh, versus one regular attempt, we'll call it a regular attempt in the emergency room only because some of these, your interpretation is not 100% perfect. Actually, some of these will reduce. Wow, that relieves a lot of stress. Um, versus going straight to the operating room and putting a chance pin and doing it in a more controlled environment. Uh, anticipating that if it still won't go to proceed to an open approach. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. There's, there's, there's not much literature on irreducible hip dislocations. And inherently, if you've re taken a hip, tried to reduce it, and reduced it, it's no longer an irreducible hip fracture dislocation. So it wouldn't include any of the femoral head fracture dislocations where the head was flipped and then reduced because that no longer falls into the category of an irreducible hip dislocation. So. Um, it's just, I think, a little bit of a self-selection there in terms of some of the stuff that's out there. But anyway, so a gentle uh, reduction attempt was made. Uh, oh, I was going to make one quick comment just because yep. I said it to you before. The easiest job in the world is Monday morning quarterback. And what's the reality, right? It's the middle of the night and you're the junior resident. You, wanna be, you don't want to be weak. Yeah, I'm going to pull the crap out of this. And maybe you talk it over with the fellow or senior resident. They sort of look at it, but they don't. They don't look at it like you've just had your coffee at 7.30 in the morning and you're looking critically at the CT scan. You've got a million things going on. So I think it's e easy, to, easy to say and sometimes harder to actually uh, consider all these things uh, when it actually happens. Yeah, that's an important point. And in this particular situation, the chain of command and the, like everyone knew what was going on. So the decision was made um, amongst the team to, not true? I didn't. Okay, so general reduction attempt was made uh, with ketamine and propofol sedation in the emergency department. The closed reduction was unsuccessful, and after the failed reduction maneuver, the leg was sort of being gently placed back onto the bed when a cracking sound was heard. A spot film uh, showed this now uh, Pipkin 3, femoral head uh, and neck fracture dislocation. This is a, uh, an image from the CT scan, which shows that the femoral head actually reduced in the acetabulum into the right orientation, but the remainder of the femoral head fragment um, uh, in the subcapital, uh, from the subcapital neck fracture is still displaced posteriorly. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can, you can see that the femoral neck is still impacted on the... Uh, on the supraacetabular iliac cortical bone. And so the question that we were kind of thinking about in retrospect is, well, you know, is this, was this a femoral neck fracture caused by the a reduction attempt, or was this a femoral neck fracture that was displaced by the reduction attempt? I don't know that it makes a huge amount of difference in terms of the treatment at this point, but in going back, it's difficult to see, but there is a, like adjacent to this bone island, if you really zoom in and you look specifically for it in the exact location, <laughs> 
after the fact, you can convince yourself maybe there's a lucency here that runs down in the same orientation of the femoral neck fracture that, that yeah, was propagated. Right? No. No. Yeah. I, I think just from a, from a teaching standpoint, though, that, you know, having a, a bone island and a pre existing non displaced fracture on an irreducible femoral head is probably the exception rather than the rule that the usual iatrogenic, iatrogenic conversion of a pick in one or two. Uh, into a Pipkin 3 is due to an over-aggressive uh, close reduction uh, te technique. Does, uh, Weavering. Was anybody here involved in that a reduction attempt? Uh, one of our junior residents, yeah. Uh, were they standing up on the table straddling the patient? No, I don't, I don't know. They were thinking it at bedside. Or? Yeah. Oh, did he leave to go to? Okay, yeah. So no one's here then. Yeah. So Stuart Small can't reduce. Can't break. Other dude, huge, can't break femoral neck. So I'm just saying, somebody years ago at Albany said, if you have trouble, and I brought this into private practice in Portland, Maine, and took it out a couple times. So if I knew this was going to be general, I put the backboard on the floor, and you guys, or the but. Basically, it converts your tactile reporting system coming back from your legs and your arms and everything. Is that you are now genuinely putting as much or as little? You don't. I'm not saying you overwhelm everything, but when you're up and half your muscle tone is in keeping your balance, and you're giving uh, acute plumber's butt viewpoints to the rest of the ER while you're up, your hands are slipping down, and you're up, and you feel yourself, and you don't know how much of your power is going into maintaining your balance and how much is to yanking the thing out. One thing I found before, you gather enough people, you drop it down, so if there's airway or stuff, you're immediately back up and on the table. But all your feedback coming in is, is your position and is genuinely what you're feeling coming out of the hip. But if you've got a plan and you want to take it a certain way, it's that and I lost a lot of that when I was trying to maintain my balance up there. And I sort of rediscovered this going back into private practice with no resident help. And, and uh, it showed itself to be a useful technique. And, you usually thought of it just some way to overpower, but also you're more accurate when you're on, when you're on solid footing with some partner holding the pelvis down, and, and your tactile feedback is genuinely what you're doing in the hip, which may be a failure, by the way, but it's not just yanking the crap out of it. Yeah, I think Larry Donners, I think, was the one said so if you put the patient lateral, you can do the same thing instead of supine. You're across the table and behind the yeah. table. Um, Interesting. Great. So some more uh, questions for the panel. So hypothetically, Monday morning quarterback style, uh, if you did notice that there was a non-displaced femoral neck fracture prior to your reduction attempt, how would this change your management? Uh, and then now that we're sort of dealing, that's good to know, thank you. All right, <laughs> now that we're, we're in the situation we're in, uh, with a dislocated hip, uh, femoral head and neck fractures, what are you gonna tell the patient? One about prognosis and two about what just happened. Uh, and then we can talk a little bit about your plan for operative intervention uh, and then I'll sort of let you guys talk about that and then we can kind of open it up to a discussion about the indication for a primary arthroplasty in this setting. I'll uh, we'll start with the first one if that's okay. So, uh, uh, so I, I think if that was noted, um, I would uh, advocate for going to the OR because that becomes a, uh, more dangerous, but also if you can control it the way you might if you had a hip dislocation with a concomitant femoral shaft fracture, you're going to have trouble uh, manipulating that fragment. Or if you had a concomitant uh, knee dislocation at the same time, uh, then it, that, that becomes harder to manage. And by using things like a chance pin or something to control that proximal segment, you have much better control and maybe have to use the least, and, and you add to that muscle relaxation, right, mm -hmm. and anesthesia so the patient's not, you know, miserable, uh, then, uh, then maybe you don't, maybe you don't break that up. Okay. Maybe. And I, I think you could even argue taking it a step further. If you did notice that there was a non-displaced fracture of the neck, just proceed right to an open, an open reduction perhaps even tryptic osteotomy open reduction approach to, because in anticipation of something potentially blocking it as well. And you're gonna to have to do that anyway. And if you're really worried about it, but it's still hanging in there, you might put K-wires into it to shore its, up, its stability 
before you do that reduction. Yeah. Yeah. The, the real problem, though, is, I mean, having been there not a lot, but often enough, is this, this lake's adducted. You have to prep the leg, and then you have to do a, a trochanteric osteotomy with a dislocated head, which is not an easy technical exercise. And um, so I, I wouldn't underestimate the difficulty of that approach, nor would I probably ever With this group of injuries, the outcomes are not great unless they're small, significant ones. And so I, I would be in situations, I'd be very reluctant to ever try a close reduction again um, without complete muscle uh, paralysis, especially in a level one trauma. So I mean, you know, if you have to wait six hours, um, we don't have enough evidence to suggest that's going to change the prognosis for thermal head blood supply. And you can certainly do a lot more damage. I mean, the analogous issue of the proximal humerus converting a nantro inferior dislocation into a, from a two part into a three part for a surgical neck or anatomic neck, even worse. So, all it takes is one of these in a career. And I don't think everybody should have to repeat it in every career. So, that um, uh, I would really caution against in this group of injuries. Uh, any type of, uh, no matter how senior you are, I don't think I would ever try a closed reduction of these again. Okay, what are you guys going to tell the patient? You will come in as the attending, you see him in the PACU pre op. Now that we have a PIP three? Now that this is the situation we have, yeah. So, so PIP three is with the subcapital. Orientation of of the of the neck fracture. Uh, we're we're O for however many uh, the seven or seven or eight. Is it the subcapital position? We're O for seven or eight. They all, they've all gone on to. We've all gone on to ABM. I, I we talked about this, but I mean I, I looked at this some years ago, seven eight years ago. I'd sent out to probably thirty different with big traumatologists who take care of, take, see, a, see a fair number of these, and ask uh, someone please for me a two-year follow-up of a Pipkin, of a Pipkin that they had survived, and no one could. Uh, we kind of collected, and we had about uh, 25 to 30, you know, identified, and it was universally poor, all ABM. So it's then to... Good. Then to sort of yeah, then to sort of preempt that a little bit, what what do you, what's the sense um, on the role for primary arthroplasty in this setting? So this guy's 38 years old; he's not old. Um, is this something knowing that your AVN rate is probably approaching 100 percent that you would consider potentially even delayed management and having you know your an arthroplasty colleague come in the next day? and just do a primary total hip instead of proceeding with an attempt at, at open reduction internal fixation. I don't know if the arthroplasty folks want to weigh in too. Yeah, I didn't put the open in there. Uh, give them a reliable result and uh, get them up out of bed. You may still have that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Over your I would say years. I would say it depends on the morphology of the neck fracture. If it's a if it's a fairly I mean it usually isn't, but if it's a a, uh, a vertically oriented that comes down to the trochanteric line, and you're going to have to do your neck cut at that level in a 38 year old, then I'd take my chances with fixing it, letting it heal, go on to ABN, and having more proximal femoral bone stop. Personally, that would be my choice. Seems that most of these, most, most of these, and haven't looked at a lot of them, tend to be almost like a pure subcapital. Yeah. And on those, let's go with that. The pure subcapital, either atrogenic or traumatically induced. Still haven't seen a survivor, but do you have the nerve to go in thirty something right to, right to total hip? I don't know. Are you still going to fix it and wait for it to? Uh, yeah, I, I, I would, but not in this patient. I would try the same thing and, and 
because because there's a little more bone. I'd like to be there when I pass them off to my joint colleague. And and yes, we a couple of us have the one that came back to an acceptable result, but I, I'm not counting on that. There would be a lot of credit being hung, um, but. And we would talk about us. The, the word "staged" would come out of my mouth more than a couple of times. Yeah, it, it did. And you had a couple other good. I uh, think thought. Oh, just, uh, a, just a, a couple other points, though. I think that if you did have a very vertical shear fracture pattern, the chances of getting that to unite with fixation are also much less. Uh, we know that, and and so you're sort of doing the patient to potential non-union, potential infected non-union, who knows, you know, and to, to have to operate uh, twice when, uh, before an arthroplasty is generally less favorable than operating um, primarily and getting the surgery done. I think that uh, as easy as we like to think that these conditions are an arthroplasty, there's plenty of literature to support that the patients that undergo conversion of failed fixation don't do as well as patients that have had a primary arthroplasty in this setting. So I think that there are some factors to weigh in here. I certainly think if there's any issues with a patient, like maybe he's an alcoholic or things like that, you want to do a trial of fixation maybe because it gives you a little bit more time to establish a relationship with the patient and for them to pass a sort of sniff test. If you want to put you know, an implant in them, it could potentially last them the rest of your life and marry the patient that way. But you know, I do think there's some other things to consider um, uh, too. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Dan, um, why don't you respond to Dr. Sassoon and give the counter argument? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you kind of referenced this, but there's also uh, data showing increased complication rates in patients who are having total hip arthroplasty done after femoral neck fracture compared to those done for something like arthritis. Yes, so actually, I, there's an article I published in Journal of Arthroplasty looking at uh, total hip uh, done in the setting of acute femoral neck fractures, and we looked at um, intra, at least intra-hospital complications at seven-year intervals, and so the number one complications that people often cite are infection and dislocation uh, in this setting, and if you look, the most recent seven years, there was really no uh, statistical difference, and this was, uh, you know, done through uh, the uh, NIH, there's a huge huge uh, registry of patients that we looked at, but um, there was no statistical difference between patients that had elected total hip arthroplasty and arthroplasty in the setting of femoral neck fracture uh, with respect to those complications. And I think with the advent of, um, uh, or it's come more into vogue, posterior capsular repair, larger heads, we're really seeing the uh, dislocation rate drop. And then I think, you know, other things play into infection because we had that experience in the past where that was a bigger complication, I think we're more sensitive to it and we're a little bit more um, aggressive with our irrigation, our closure technique in these patients. I think we pay a little bit more attention to detail. So, you know, I think some of those complications we're seeing um, improve, improvements in it. Yeah, totally. I think this patient in particular, be just because of the amount of soft tissue damage, sure. this I think sort of exceeds a standard uh, femoral neck fracture in a, you know, an elderly patient. Uh, because of the posterior hip dislocation and the amount of um, uh, disruption of the posterior capsule of the labrum, uh, I, I, one of the things I think we could talk about would be letting that sort of heal or scar in before you attempt it to go then do a primary arthroplasty where that's been so um, attenuated and disrupted. Uh, and then again, the other thing would be something like posterior or a heterotopic ossification in this setting with the amount of muscle and soft tissue damage. I don't think that you avoid that by doing an, um, a fixation procedure. Uh, because that still is a, a complication of fixing it instead of doing an arthroplasty, but you have the potential to, to intervene at the time of arthroplasty or at a different surgery to resect heterotopic ossification if it develops. No, sorry, I was, I was just going to mention that, that awesome, that huge numbers on that study, but uh, subgroup analysis of this guy versus the geriatric, you know, the capsule still intact and the, the amount of contusion of the muscle and soft tissue for infection risk is a little bit different, but and then not to like sort of belabor the point but I just want to bring up some some of the literature that has talked more specifically really about femoral head fractures not necessarily femoral head neck fracture dislocations uh, discusses intraoperative assessment of the viability of the femoral head as it relates to the position of the femoral head fragment if for example a maybe superfovial femoral head fracture 
with uh, like a crush injury and cartilage damage would be one that after sort of seeing that you might convert intraoperatively to something like a total hip in an older patient. So just to kind of throw that out there. So this patient underwent urgent open reduction uh, of the posterior hip dislocation. Uh, then open reduction internal fixation of the femoral head and neck through a Smith-Peterson approach with a rectus tenotomy. This happened before our standard start time, so we pushed to get this thing going in the operating room before just sort of waiting for the first case in the morning. Uh, intraoperatively, we noted uh, that there were no soft tissue attachments to either of the femoral head fragments. The hip was dislocated uh, superiorly um, and buttonholed through a defect between the bone and the labrum, and the uh, posterior wall ass tabin was intact. These intraop images show the way that we extracted the femoral head. It was extremely difficult to extract um, the, the posteriorly dislocated aspect of the femoral head. Um, it required a couple of shant pins and an extensive release of the capsule and labrum to be able to free it up enough. Uh, the uh, femoral neck was then dislocated anteriorly. The femoral head was fixed on the back table with mini frag screws that were countersunk into the femoral head and uh, was fixed with uh, three cannulated screws. This is an immediate post-op image. Uh, the lateral was challenging, but that's the best one we got. And then just sort of briefly, we don't have to necessarily belabor this, but um, post-op protocol, this guy's going to be non-weight bearing for a long time. Um, but would you guys do anything for HO prophylaxis? And if so, is there a protocol that you guys are using? Yeah, I choose that particular approach. Uh, so it, we discussed doing uh, an approach from the back and then um, <laughs> flipping the patient and then doing a smith peat to, to reduce and, and fix the fracture. Uh, I think the decision-making point came on our assessment of our ability to get that posteriorly dislocated femoral head fragment from the front. Uh, and we felt like with the rectus tenotomy we could do that um, and that not doing two approaches would decrease the infection rate and potentially the rate of heterotopic ossification. All right, so I guess maybe one more question. Uh, so if you guys did notice either displacement or uh, non-union of this femoral neck fracture, how early would you intervene to convert to say something like a valgus producing intertrochanteric osteotomy? Or is this at this point in this patient, is this one that pretty quickly you would refer to an arthroplasty surgeon because it, it seems like it's a, you're, you're probably your success of, of doing that procedure is probably pretty low. You're not, obviously, you're not going to, not obviously, but you're likely not to see the, the ADN manifest itself until the patient's weight-bearing, right? And so I just worry that if, if you see evidence that it doesn't appear to be healing, I mean, I, I, think, it's, I think it's probably done. I mean, you've got an avascular head and it's in a sub, relative subcapital location that's, that's popped on the top. I don't, I don't think all the osteotomies in the world is going to bring back the blood supply when it's fixed under that. Okay. Other options for approach? Dr. Hanson asked why you used that one. Are there other options you can do anything? So um, we kind of talked to tro about a tro trochanteric slide, um, which is nice because it allows you to look at the femoral, uh, or tro trochanteric osteotomy, which allows you to look at the femoral head on FOSS um, and dislocate it anteriorly again. Um, you could do a uh, um, coker langenbeck or like a posterior approach to extract the femoral head fragment, flip them and do an anterior approach or like a harding uh, to reduce the femoral head, but. What's the other advantage of, of a lateral or posterior approach? As opposed to a smith Pete? Yeah. Well, the patient already has posterior instability, right. so you're basically now di disrupting capsule. Posteriorly has done been done traumatically and now you're surgically disrupting the anterior capsule. I just think that you want to go through the zone of injury for this, if possible. Um, you will have had circumferential disruption by the time you finish this, so if there is a risk of heterotopic ossification, you've increased that because anterior approaches, you've gotten all the muscles that form bone, right? Rectus, iliocapsularis, and then, ili and then minimus. Minimus was traumatic, and then you add the surgical component, so. Um, uh, I think that, I mean, it's a real decision in a situation like this is, is sort of what are you familiar with? I don't think this is an easy surgical dislocation because this will require a dislocation to get the fragment out. You won't be able to do this without a dislocation. Mm -hmm. 
so, um, but it leaves the anterior capsule erectus and the other capsule is intact. So um, that's the alternative. Um, it also allows you theoretically the, the ability to repair the posterior capsule on the way out um, and the leg room. And um, so I've never seen one of these dislocate after they're fixed, um, but it, it, the long term considerations are then if you come back for the arthroplast and you need to, then the theory is <coughs> you'd be close to where you would be with the original decision making and your anterior versus other approaches for your arthroplasty. Great. So the patient was seen six weeks post-op. His wounds had healed. He did have some, some lateral thigh numbness, had been compliant with his non-weight bearing precautions, did have pain with hip range of motion, but there was no interval displacement of his fracture. The plans for physical therapy to maintain hip range of motion to keep him non-weight bearing for three months and to see how he does. So These are the... This uh, is from about eight weeks ago. Yeah, so this, he just had his six-week follow-up. So these are his films. And then uh, I'm not going to belabor this, but this paper exists out of Harborview that discusses uh, irreducible fracture dislocations of uh, the femoral head with, uh, without posterior wall tabular fractures. Most people know this paper, but we can, I can send it out to the junior residents if they don't. So. All right, so you might find some similarities between this and what we just talked about. I'm Paige Mallet, I'm one of the chief residents, and this is our last case of the day. She's a 20-year-old female who, in what was a possible suicide attempt, was ejected from a vehicle traveling at high speeds after it rolled several times. Um, she was initially seen at an outside facility. She was complaining of shortness of breath there, so she was intubated before being transferred to our facility, arriving about six hours after the initial injury. Uh, she's an otherwise healthy girl. The injuries known prior to arrival were a left femoral neck fracture dislocation, a pelvic ring injury consisting of bilateral sacral fractures and right superior and inferior rami fractures, bilateral pneumothoraces with pulmonary lacerations and chest tubes, and an orbital floor fracture. So this is her initial injury film seen on her AP pelvis um, from the trauma series at the outside facility. And just some representative slices of her CT scan. Um, on arrival here, she was somewhat under resuscitated and had a base deficit of greater than 10, but it responded really promptly to fluid resuscitation. And um, she was cleared about nine hours after arrival uh, for operative intervention for this with us. Her so the question is, as you kind of touched on already, how do we get this out? What do we do with it? Any Maybe we just ask a crystal ball to the to anyone in the front row. Could you go back to the injury AP? Thinks that there's still. Well, that was unfortunate. <laughs> it was fast. The injury AP. I don't I like presentation we, mode. <laughs> who thinks there's soft tissue attached to that? To that head. And if so, because it just might influence the way one decides to approach this. She's, 20, she's 19? She just turned 20. Docs, team. Not much chance, not much chance, and if there is, and there might be, uh, is it function, functional enough to carry a blood supply, I guess. So, but, but you got to go get it. <laughs> yeah, just so, leave it there. so um, it's one of those consent for everything, evaluate while you're in there, have a plan. A lot might consider putting it back together from us another approach, but um, she'd been consented thoroughly so that anything you found, and I, I, I don't believe in making it up as you go along, but sometimes you make it up as you go along. Do you have any other comments on this one? Connor, since this one wasn't yours, but I think similar to what you talked about before, I'd probably do it, you know, in Harding or Shrugs here. So I do one approach and uh, likelihood of success here. I guess you're praying for her age to be on her side. That's fine, because I, I, this is one where I would really not want to go lateral posterior. And I think, I mean, I, without. I kind of like to see on some of the other images how far that is, but to me this is a classic sort of Peterson approach with some external exposure to get that out. I wouldn't want to have to go through that to a, to 
through it uh, by gastric or any other approach for that. Mm -hmm. that would be this thing was almost through the teals. She was, she's very thin. She was BMI probably about 19. You could actually palpate her head and her butt yeah. more so than you could palpate her greater trochanter. My wife said that about me. <laughs> <laughs> Feel the head <laughs> in the butt. Uh, you really do wonder if this isn't the time to go where the money is and, and assess it and do the coker and might be able to. It's devoid of all soft tissue attachments. It's, it's devoid and it sure looks suspicious for that, in which case you can try to fix it from the back and if not, pop it back in from an alternate, alternate exposure. Adam, like 20, sorry. 20 Same years old. old. Yeah. Uh, would I do it till later on? Yeah. Uh, I'd probably try to save, save this one. But given its trance, it's a low, even if it's, com I mean, it's, if you, if you can juggle it, yeah, still. I'd probably try to put it on the ice, you know, just roll the dice. Yep. For a 20 year old, you know? Yeah. I think the other benefit in trying to save it in her is that making that hip stable uh, after the displacement and disruption probably circumferentially of the entire capsule would be difficult. Um, for the reasons discussed, because we could feel it, we felt we had to go get it from the back. It would be really hard to retrieve from Ms. Smith-Peterson. So we positioned her lateral, um, and as we actually just came through the gluteal fascia, the head was sitting right there. Um, we felt a single small band of tissue remaining attached to it. Um, so Dr. Tatesman drilled at the chondral junction. There was no bleeding at all. Um, so we removed it, closed the wound, repositioned her, and performed a Smith-Peterson to uh, reintroduce the head to the acetabulum. We decided not to continue the coker because it was right there. We didn't have to take down any ex short external rotators. We w didn't have to disrupt the um, abductors any further in order to approach the acetabulum and try to fix it from the back, so. We we're left with that. And then, how do you choose what to fix it with? Does anyone have strong preferences for a sliding hip screw, cannulated screws, all of the above? Uh, you know, I think, um, I think we have a, a, a trend towards using a, a sliding hip screw more of these, although in my case I just did in the last case, we didn't because I thought the sliding hip screw would explode the thing we just put together back on the back table. Uh, so I, I think that is becoming uh, my go-to, either a classic one or the heel core blade equivalent. Um, my mechanical thing would be for the hip screw, but I, I've had a few males like this, and I put in the K-wires and everything else, and I pre-tapped and everything, yep. and I kept spinning that son of a, and I thought I had all that worked out beforehand. And I kept, uh, this happened to me now twice, so I don't like multiple screws for a couple of reasons. They failed in yet different ways. So I'm, you know, I'm returning to the hip screw and really prefer that. And I knew what was about to happen. I pre-tapped, I pre-tapped with a slightly larger tap, I put in K, well, this is a couple times now, not, it's not one. And the thing, all of a sudden you'd be getting it, I got it, I got it in the silhouette of the neck would change, and, and I start to spin. So I'm, I'm looking for other people who have mastered this, and I'm, in other words, I have not mastered this part of the thing, and what's best. That's why I kind of converted to the, you know, I know it's a more expensive implant, but the, and not to use a company one, but some type of a helical plate that taps yep. in that seems to introduce. Now, you, I'd rather be given it a little wacky, wacky yep. longitudinal with the neck, but maybe less spin. Yeah. So in young patients, especially young males, um, I've converted yeah. to that. My spinners were have to be male. They're the, the higher risk people. And, and if, you, <clears throat> if you're going to whack on the head, then I mean the best series ever reported for Powell's threes was the one thirty degree blade. And that well, it's not been repeated, but um, you know, it's, and you just have to be more careful. I mean, this is one you, where you 
instead of you probably have to pre-drill for blade insertion to make it easier. But I mean, certainly the best series to date on Powell's trees with the 130 degree. In that case, with a one hole, that doesn't really make any difference. You could use whatever you had, but it is a non-offset blade. So I think that's the way to go on these. If you um, if you're gonna if you're gonna be impacting the head anyhow. Um, then at least you're not removing very much bone if it fails. Whereas opposed to the barrel of the either the helical or the standard is going to take a lot of bone and it's going to make the salvage more difficult. Hmm. I just had a quick question. So uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, doing two approaches here to get the head and to fix the fracture. The only thing I would just note is that you know, short external rotators come down when you do a cocoa and bottom approach to uh, an fix an acetabular fracture. So just because they come down doesn't mean you're necessarily sacrificing blood supply to, to, to the head. You usually do it at a distance where you're not doing releasing it directly off bone. Additionally, I, I think that this the blood supply of this head is kind of a moot point because whether or not you take down the short external rotators or not, the head's blood supply has been completely disrupted. So I, I, I don't know that there was added benefit or you're protecting anything by fixing it at, at that point from the front, you know what I mean? But um, that's just sort of something to think about when you're thinking about blood supply to come ahead. I think at this point, like the force was already out of the barn, so fixing it from the back versus fixing it from the front doesn't, I don't think it makes a difference. That's a um, good point, I agree. Um, Yeah, I was wondering about that. Have you ever done one from? Well, I mean, I, I, if I was going to do it, I would just, I mean, I can't tell, is that a coker or a, or a Gibson? Yes. I mean, it's perfectly set up. Just go ahead and dislocate, stick the head back on, reduce it like you would slip, reduce it, and fix it. I mean, that would be the easiest way to do it. And it, it really, the, the short rotators are really not an issue as far as the blood supply. But if you believe that there's the preserving the short rotators for for arthroplasty is important, then it is important. So, and I think most of us who do acetabular fracture don't think the operator interns, the conjoint tendon, makes it to recovery room even when we when we repair it. So, um, so I, I think that's the reason for, and I, and I can understand the rationale. I mean, if you, especially if it's a subcutaneous femoral head, and you happen to be Posterior, and it's more difficult. It's just a more difficult dislocation to go through that, and I, I would, uh, I don't think it's really. I think it, you can tell by the first X-ray there's no blood supply left in his head. So, but so you're advocating if you're going to go and get that head out from the back in the kind of subcutaneous or under the fascia of the, uh, the uh, G-Max, then just continuing on that path, or. Are you saying well, I mean, not do I mean, that? If, 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 I don't know, because I mean, your, your description of the, you know, head and the butt, right. so to speak, um, it really depends. I mean, if it looks like it would land itself to really a medius maximus interval more than anything else, which is an easier dislocation as opposed to a coker. So that would be, I mean, but, it, but again, if the plane is established, you take the head out and all of a sudden you're then looking at the rest of the approach, I don't, I don't see anything wrong with this. I wasn't there, so I, you know, I think it's a reasonable call. I, I don't know that I would have done it that way, but I, I think it's reasonable. Um, we went with the DHHS and a, an anti-rotation screw for most of the reasons that you guys have all touched on. Young, strong, bone, wanted to minimize the bone removed. Um, a four-hole side plate was used because the 130 DHHS does not come in a two. What, what did the soft tissue look like anterior? It was very normal. I had one not with the head, but with the posterior wall, the acetabulum, basically subcutaneous. And uh, the piriformis was a bolst, the minimus was trash, the external rotators were a bolst, and debrided all this. And then we took him back because his, I think he got infected, but. Uh, his rectus was dead, and it had died because it had been full stop. The, the, the hip had gone so posteriorly that it had basically had a tension failure in part of the rectus anterior. 
So to have the native anatomy anterior and fluffy, I think. We went through it. Well, thank you, Dr. Burgess. <laughs> Dr. Burgess, just want to extend a thank you on behalf of the residents and, and the, the rest of the people here, as, as well as the panel for both days. Uh, I think I can speak on behalf of the residents. It's been a very educational experience, and um, uh, thank you so much. You, you have to come up here and realize uh, why we refer to our homeland as the Socialist Republic of Washington State when you open your envelope. <laughs> and uh, thank you. That was uh, really wonderful. All the cornball stuff about feeling at home here is really true. And so. Uh, First of all, the, the, trauma, the ortho club's a good one to be in. The, the, the trauma club is, is, is as good as it gets with in that. And uh, the, all of us in this room are going to manage injury at some time or another. And uh, once again, to come to a leader in the field and, and, and be flattered enough that you want to hear what I have to say, uh, it uh, means a lot to me. And um, I'd like to thank my brothers and sisters for having another old fart come over and, and rotate through some of our our thinking that we've developed over time. And, and I, I understand this, and I'm, I, I'm pretty experienced, and, and, the, and all, every cliche comes up. I've learned a whole lot more from my failures than my successes. So I happen to be encyclopedia. <laughs> because you can't pick something that I haven't screwed up, and it's fun to share some of that experience with you. So thanks. Appreciate it.